So good evening. Um, it is Thursday, June 10th, 2021, 7.33 p.m. Um, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to call this meeting of the board to order. Uh, as we begin, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. So from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Patrick yep. Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Sean O'Rourke. Mm -hmm. Sean is on by telephone. Confirm that in a minute. Uh, Aaron Ford. Here. Thank you. And Stephen Revlack. Here. Oh, well, thank you. Um, from the town, uh, Rick Fallarelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'm here. Perfect. Uh, Vincent Lee. Here. Thank you. Um, and I believe um, Jennifer Rate is on from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Here. Thank you so much. Are there any other <clears throat> uh, town staff in? Susan Chapnick from the Arlington Conservation Commission. Susan, good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, outside council, uh, council and consulting engineers, uh, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Haverty. Um, on behalf of Beta Group, uh, Marty Nover. Good evening, Mr. Chair. I also have with me tonight Bill McGrath and Tyler DeRuder. Wonderful. Thank Thanks. you all. Um, <clears throat> and appearing for the applicant, uh, Stephanie Kiefer. Good evening. Kiefer, good evening. Good to see you. Um, and I believe I've seen John Hessian is on, Gwen Noyce is on, I believe Art Clipfell is on as well, and I believe I saw Scott Thornton and Scott Vlasic. Are there any I've missed? Uh, I, I believe Kyle may be on. I, I think that I saw him. Um, yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. wonderful. Thank you. Kyle Wheeler, and then also we have Ambrose Donovan from McPhail. Thank you. Okay. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, other participants are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Ms. Chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Um, <clears throat> but we only have one item on our agenda this evening, which is the um, excuse me, comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place. Um, as we begin, I'd like to <clears throat> review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. Uh, so at the May 23rd hearing, the applicant presented their revised design, including six duplex houses on Dorothy Road with a combination of senior independent living and assisted living with an assisted living, uh, excuse me, with a combination senior independent living and assisted living building behind. Following up on that evening's hearing, the applicant submitted revised documents to the board on Tuesday, June 8th. 
Those documents were posted to the agenda for this evening's hearing. This evening's discussion will focus on the revised proposal from the applicant. We will open with a presentation by the applicant followed by questions from the board. After board members, members of the public will be invited to provide their questions and comments. Um, <clears throat> so with that, um, Ms. Kiefer, if I can ask you to um, explain to us where the, where the application is at this point. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the board. Um, just as a, an introductory, if um, we could also allow screen sharing for Scott Vlasic, um, um, so that when it comes time for him in the presentation to pull up material, he's able, he's able to do that. Um, and Rick, so- can you hear that? He is good to go, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rick. Thank, thank you me. very much. Um, so uh, with that said, and, and I just wanted to do one quick update in terms of the project team here. That's today. We have a, we have a, a, a full um, slate of folks, hopefully, to answer any questions that you have. So in addition to myself, we have um, Art Clipfell and Gwen Noyes. We have um, Scott Blastic and Kyle Wheeler from Bruce Hamilton um, Architect. We have um, uh, the civil engineer, John Hessian. We also have... Uh, Scott Thornton from Vanessa, um, Bob um, Bob Angler from SEB Housing, and as I um, and then Ambrose Donovan from McVale Assessments. So uh, I think I accidentally forgot to double check that Bob was on the call, but I, I saw his video pop up. Um, so you. with that said, as as you said, Mr. Chairman, at the last hearing um, on May 23rd, we had. Uh, come back to the board with the revised concept, um, building upon the board's request for us to take a look about um, as to the reintroduction of those six duplex townhouses, um, which we did. And then behind that, um, there would be a, uh, a senior building, um, a four floor senior building. And um, based on the input that we received from the board and um, at the last hearing and, and for the questions that they had, we, we went back and um, further assess our, our building plans, our civil design, our traffic, and those reflected, as you made reference to, in our submittal of June 8th to the board. <clears throat> and there was likewise, um, according to my notes, there were some, um, there were some comments or specific areas that the board had kind of asked us to take a look at. And so we, we hope to provide um, greater clarity or responses to that this evening. So uh, with that said, um, in somewhat in the order of our presentation this evening, um, first we're going to start off with a submittal of the updated architectural plans and elevations and perspectives for the project. And as uh, Greenstacks um, and Bruce Hamilton will be describing for you in, in greater detail as to um, modifications or, or additional information, um, maybe it's more appropriate for, for both the duplex structures as well as the senior residential building. And, and then with the senior residential building, we've also included a set of floor plans for the board to review. And it'll, it'll be a combination of um, studio one and two bedrooms as, as they will present. Um, one of the, uh, just to highlight, and I'm sure that Art and, and Scott and Gwen will um, make um, underscore these, but um, a couple of the highlights of the changes or, or the um, topics that we'll discuss tonight is the, the senior living, the counts, and it had been presented as 126 units. Um, it's actually been revised downward by two units to 124 residential units with, with the balance of the space within that building to be common areas. And um, likewise, in further consultation with our uh, senior living consultant, um, the market really, the need out there is for um, senior living with services. And so the, the senior building will be dedicated to that senior independent living with services. Um, and, and so th those types of services and amenities generally are intended to, they provide socialization on, on premises, entertainment or education, physical um, activity, coordination with healthcare providers for um, on-site medical health checks and, and um, uh, optional meal plans and other related services that I think that th they'll get into. Um, and then uh, just quickly touching on that, uh, that senior living building as well, it had, um, there had been a, a little bit of confusion at the last hearing relative to the, on the southern side of the structure, um, there's 
a part of the building is within like the outer 10 to 15 feet of, of the aura. And there had been confusion um, and, and we had tried to um, resolve it that under the prior multifamily, the 172 unit project, the, there had always been structure within that small portion of the aura. Um, it had been the, uh, like the parking garage structure and then maybe some courtyard. Um, and I think that that issue or that question that had been raised at the last hearing has been resolved. Um, the Conservation Commission submitted a letter to the board dated May 28, um, uh, uh, confirming that, um, that that small area of impact was not objectionable and that um, that, that area had been um, consistent with what had been part of the prior program when it was a multifamily building that there had been impact to that same area. Um, and so that has not changed at all. Um, that, that small impact into the aura. Um, uh, likewise, with respect to the duplex units, as um, Art and Scott and Gwen will be uh, presenting to you, the, uh, the board had asked us to take a look at the duplex structures. Um, we have reduced the height slightly by um, a couple of feet. And what, what it does, we think, is it, it is um, consistent with the neighborhood, but it also continues to help um, provide the buffer um, to the senior housing behind that. And um, while our property isn't within the more restrictive R2 zoning district, um, there's, there's slight differences between what, what allowable building heights are, but what we've done is we've tried to make an adjustment to um, make a nice transition, if you will. And um, I think the last thing I'm gonna just speak to in terms of the architecture with the duplex buildings, um, there was a, a question that had been um, posed to us within the Conservation Commission's May 28th letter, um, uh, basically just, just asking us to consider whether or not we could not have, um, we could exclude basements in the two easternmost duplexes, which are located in those shallow fingers of floodplain. And um, we, we considered this and, um, and, and we took a look at this. Um, and, and just to be clear that that impact to that floodplain area has kind of always been an issue. Um, but I think what's, what's important to underscore and um, probably uh, John will, will address this more eloquently than I'm going to, but the, the impact into floodplain um, has already been addressed through the, um, the uh, um, compensatory storage, the two to one compensatory storage. And so whether it's just foundation or whether it's foundation in a partial basement, um, it doesn't quite make a difference there. And then in terms of um, ensuring that the residents of those two do, or the, of those two buildings, so the, the four units of those, um, we have, um, I think our architects as well as we have um, McPhail here that can speak to the fact that it would be, um, there'd be a, a, a waterproof barrier along the uh, floors and the walls of that um, structure. So um, at, at this point, we'll continue to discuss with the board, but we think that based on the amount of compensatory storage that's already been provided for, um, we're not, that there's no additional storage that's being lost. Um, and also that there, there are, um, sound engineering ways to make certain that it's just waterproof, that um, removal of those two partial basements um, doesn't really make sense. Um, in addition to the fact that the convenience to the actual occupants of those buildings, um, it provides a place to store whatever, bikes, skis, um, equipment. Um, uh, from, from our architectural presentation, then I think it will move to um, a combination of um, McPhail simply to address any questions that the board may have relative to those basements. And then also there had been a question about um, pile driving um, and, um, and we had said that we don't anticipate pile driving at all um, and that if necessary, it, the construction um, for the senior building may include aggregate piers. And I, I think that Mr. Ronovan can just briefly explain that to the board so they have an understanding kind of what that means and, and how that different, how that differs from um, piles or, um, yeah. And then lastly, um, 
um, after our civil and, and kind of geotech issues are addressed, um, Scott Ven or Scott Thornton from Vanessa um, has updated traffic um, as the board had asked questions about how the traffic would be impacted by the revised program. And Scott will give a brief presentation on that. Uh, I anticipate our whole presentation will last somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. And we're very happy to take any questions that the board may have. And with that being said, um, if I could have Scott pull up the, um, the, uh, the plans. And so this first screen as I turn things over to Scott and Art is just the revised concept that we presented um, on May 23rd, just so everyone has that in their mind. Now there have been some slight adjustments to this, um, but just so in case anyone missed the May 23rd public hearing, um, you see the six duplexes along the front of Dorothy Road, and then behind that would be the, um, the senior uh, living building. So um, with that being said, um, Scott and Art, do you want to move forward with your updated site sections and architectural plans and drawings? Sure, and <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, my name is Scott Blasak from Bruce Hamilton Architects. Um, I guess Art and Gwen, I'd like to uh, first ask you if there's anything that you'd like to start off with or, or, or say. Uh, I'm happy to go through the plans, um, but wanted to give you an, the first bite at the apple. Maybe... Uh, Maybe they'd like me to continue. <laughs> so feel free to feel free to chime in, Art or Gwen, at any time. Sorry, I forgot. I'm sorry, we were on mute. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just saying that that uh, we wanted to show this briefly, even though it has been updated uh, uh, since our last meeting. But uh, there were just a couple of things. One is that we wanted to emphasize how much landscape area we are introducing to the plans that weren't there before, and to reiterate how. Um, of the six duplex townhouses, three of them will be designated to be affordable. That is, they would, for the, the owners who uh, take possession of them, they will be, as we've talked about in the past, something would, that would be a, a means of, of generating wealth that has been not available to many people in the past. So that's uh, one of the major benefits that this whole scheme does provide. Um, and as we've talked about, the amount of area that is now available for on the, on the West End for landscape um, benefits for the, for the uh, residents of the community, as well as um, what will be going on in the uh, area the surrounding. The so, area. well, that Scott can, can deal with the cursor. But anyway, there were just a few things that we wanted to, to make sure that anybody who wasn't in the hearing last time would, would see that we have uh, really appreciably uh, increased the amount of, of, of arable land that will have a, a benefit of, of being uh, absorptive of, of whatever rain falls on it. So that's, that's just, we can go back to that later if you want. But. You can go on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to talk about this? Uh, no, Scott. Okay, Scott, you get to talk about this. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so, I'm going to just briefly go back to the uh, the site plan. Um, I think Stephanie gave a really great kind of overview, and I'm going to try to keep my presentation pretty brief um, tonight because I do think. Um, you know, what we're presenting tonight in terms of the architecture is really just um, minor revisions uh, through notes that we heard uh, and things that came out of the last hearing. But um, what uh, Stephanie was talking about, the two, just for the benefit of those who, um, you know, were trying to follow along, these two duplexes, uh, duplex buildings, which com are comprised of four separate units. Um, those are the, uh, the duplex units that Stephanie was referring to at the beginning. Um, so what, uh, what I'll show you tonight, um, and I Gwen had a really good point too that you know we're, we wanted to show this for the benefit of anyone who maybe wasn't present at the last hearing. So like I said, I'll go through this fairly quickly and then 
um, certainly happy to answer questions at the end. Um, so in the next slide, what I'm going to show you is the perspective down Dorothy Road. I think maybe most people have seen this before, but where my cursor is right now is approximately where I'm standing in that next perspective view, and I'm looking west down Dorothy Road. So we'll be really looking at um, what Stephanie was explaining about how the, um, the duplexes along Dorothy Road are, um, you know, more or less screening the four-story senior living building behind. So as I go to that uh, slide here, the perspective has been revised slightly from, uh, largely it's unchanged from the last version that we saw back in May. But as Stephanie noted, we did uh, reduce the height of the duplexes by two feet. Um, so it still allows uh, plenty of screening, uh, but it, it fits in uh, better with the neighborhood and the scale. We also um, made some minor architectural adjustments to the, um, the duplex uh, here. And I can show you a little bit better on the next uh, couple slides here. So this is a uh, north elevation, a streetscape elevation, if you will, of Dorothy Road. Um, along the top of the page here are all six uh, townhouses, I'm sorry, duplexes. And below that, we've just uh, kind of enlarged uh, three of them. Um, and then in the background, you can see the, uh, the scale of the um, uh, senior living building behind it. Uh, now, this is, of course, a two-dimensional view. Um, and, uh, you know, so, of course, the four-story building is taller. But again, back, looking back to the perspective view, um, you can see how the, uh, the duplexes will surface uh, screen that building. This is the uh, individual view of a typical um, one style of duplex that we have. And this is the other uh, duplex. This is the one that uh, we made a few tweaks to the architecture, primarily up in this area where the dormer uh, sits in the roof here. Uh, but inside the, um, the floor plans of these units would be uh, more or less identical. This is a west elevation. Um, this is actually a new drawing that we hadn't um, submitted last time, but you're, um, you're standing uh, to the west of the uh, site, uh, western part of the site, and you're looking east. So this right here is the main entrance to the uh, senior living building. This is a uh, duplex unit out near Dorothy Road. So this view kind of gives you a sense of the scale. Um, and again, if you're, if you're to kind of trace a sight line here, uh, really get a sense of how, that, how these duplexes are scaling, uh, screening the, um, uh, the vision to the four-story building behind um, from the ground level. Um, but you can see here the approach to the building would be, uh, per the site plan, you know, would kind of have an entrance driveway here. Uh, there's some parking, there's a turnaround uh, for easy drop off and pick up at the main entrance. And here you see the entrance to the parking garage down below. Uh, these are two site sections. Again, we, were, we showed these last, um, last month. And if I zoom in, you can actually see kind of the uh, site line that, that we've uh, drawn here to illustrate uh, the screening of the building. So these are really diagrams to, to show more of the, uh, you know, the relative heights um, of, the, uh, of, the, of all aspects of the site, really, how the buildings sit in context to the, to the road and to the rest of the site. Um, this one shows a uh, cut through the western wing, I guess you'd say, where the um, building is farther from Dorothy Road. And this next one here is cut through uh, as you move further to the east, um, the building does jog and gets a little bit closer uh, to Dorothy Road. None of this has really with, changed. With this section, Scott, you might uh, point where that car is and point out that we did, uh, I think we talked about it before, but we raised the floor of that uh, garage by three feet, uh, thinking of the hydrology. So that's, that's actually up three feet from uh, the uh, 172 version. That was the same as last time, though. Yeah. Yeah, no, but that, that, I, I agree, Art. That is good to, uh, you know, kind of underscore here. So the garage from the, um, you know, multi, as compared to the multifamily uh, proposal, uh, that's absolutely correct. The garage has been raised approximately three feet. And you can see that the garage on the, the backside 
uh, here is not very far below uh, the surrounding grade. It looks as if the grade is higher on this side, um, and it is. Uh, however, that, that is more or less an effect of the land that will be uh, actually bermed up intentionally um, because we wanted to be able to uh, have a nice entrance into the uh, main entrance of the building. Uh, if I go back a couple slides here. Uh, so they, what I'm trying to say is this is the predominant uh, grade surrounding the building. Uh, the garage is only set a couple feet into the ground. Uh, when we go to the west that we were looking at a couple slides ago, uh, this area is what I'm referring to. The, 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 gr the land will be burned up so that uh, there's an at-grade entrance at the main entrance. Um, Uh, what uh, the next few slides that we have are new, uh, and they are um, an attempt at you know kind of giving uh, the board a little bit of an idea of what the floor plans for these uh, for the multi uh, family I'm sorry for the four story uh, senior living building could look like. Um, so we've actually started to lay out units here. Uh, this is all fairly schematic, but I think the main uh, point to make here is uh, the main entrance being to the building being right here. Uh, we've kind of kept this area just as a shaded uh, green area to indicate uh, the common area. And that common area would contain all of the uh, amenities and the spaces that Stephanie was mentioning in her presentation. So we, what we really end up with is in the context of a senior living with services building, you know, you're talking about a building that has a larger percentage of common space in it uh, compared to a typical apartment building. So you may be talking about up to 35% of the building area across all the floors is uh, devoted to those amenities and common spaces um, compared to say maybe approximately 20% in a, uh, a typical uh, multifamily building. So there's certainly more common space. Um, you can see that that common space would be focused kind of toward the core of the building. We've still got circulation like elevators and stairs uh, going up and down, uh, but that area would actually be programmed, uh, you know, in more detail uh, once we know a little bit more about uh, the spaces that would be needed by these particular uh, residents in this uh, this community. Uh, Art, anything else that you wanted to uh, add? Well, to that? I think um, it, it's possible. If you look at the second floor, you'll see that it's that we have the same amount of. Um, of common area and it, that could change, you know, where we have more on the first floor and a little bit less on the second floor. Uh, but I think it's worth saying we are talking now to a, a very experienced um, senior um, housing uh, consultant and somebody who would probably be very interested, shouldn't say probably is interested in in uh, working with us on this project. And the, the specific design would be uh, an interaction between them and us uh you know allocating these these common spaces in a way that works for them uh, but we have obviously consulted them and we, they, we have the right amount of it uh it's the question of the disposition of it that uh, is tbd to be determined yep excellent so this uh as art was saying is the second floor plan um very similar to the to the ground floor plan in terms of allocation of units and common space. Uh, third floor plan is here, would be primarily devoted to, to units. And the fourth floor plan um, is a little bit more of the same. However, we do have, uh, have allocated, uh, uh, being on the fourth floor, you know, anticipate there may be some uh, fairly nice space uh, in this area, particularly on the, uh, the side of the building that faces uh, to the southeast toward Boston. Um, to have a little uh, country kitchen, you know, gathering type uh, common space. Um, so we have that allocated on the fourth floor. One thing, uh, if you go back to that ground floor, uh, Scott, it might be worth mentioning that uh, just on the south side in the ground store, right behind the uh, elevators, there'll be a 13 foot by 62 foot uh, open balcony, uh, which I think would be, uh, it's not, it's not the whole thing, actually. It's just 62 feet. So it's next to the kitchen. Okay. So you can, um, you know, we're kind of setting that up for uh, 
uh, is facing south. Obviously, it's looking out over the uh, mm -hmm. over the wetland, and uh, I think it'd be a really nice thing. They can come down the elevator and uh, be on the sunny side of the building and look out at the trees and other aspects of uh, nature. Yep. Th yeah. Thank you, Art. I forgot to mention that. So I think the last uh, plan we have is the garage plan. Um, this is probably, um, you know, very few changes from last time, although we did um, allocate, I think, some of the space over here um, to uh, as common space. Um, so you can see the, the layout of the parking, um, again, access to the elevators um, from that uh, garage level, as well as stairways that lead you up to the lobby and the main entrance to the garage. Uh, at the west end here. So I think with that, that that's um, everything that I wanted to say. Uh, Art and Gwen, is there anything else that uh, you wanted to add to that? Well, one one uh, thing, just just a thought. I, I think uh, you know we've talked many times now to the um, the fellow we're working with on on the senior living with services, and uh, I think it's worth noting that uh, uh, these people are not necessarily in assisted living, certainly not in a nursing home, but they do tend to be 80 to 90 years uh, of age uh, by, by sort of average. And um, so that has something to do with the, with the use of the building. And I think Scott will talk a little bit about that, the impact on traffic, uh, because some of these people might even have a car, but they seldom drive it. And I think another thing that really is worth keeping in mind as we go through this is that uh, the, uh, the senior living uh, consultant and hope, hopefully at some point our partner in developing this um, is, uh, uh, is, has, has stated uh, flatly that uh, the deliveries to this building can be controlled by, by them as a company and be between 10, 10 o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, avoiding peak traffic. So I think the impact on traffic is significant and obviously Scott will have a lot more to say about that. And I, I think um, I'll just mention a couple things about, about when we say senior living with services, that means that there would be um, wellness and security and uh, uh, you know exercise room and things that are, are services that are available uh, on a kind of a la carte Basis. It is not assisted living. Um, so, uh, but the, many of the things that would make it comfortable for a person to be there, cleaning and laundry service and stuff like that, can be can be uh, available. And this is all just uh, based on a, a, a preliminary analysis, and of course, uh, this this uh, uh, senior living specialist uh, his take on what the market is where you know he's he's uh, believing that this is where the market and this particular site at this particular time is so he'd be meeting the demand as he sees it i don't know if scott scott just put that the 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 site plan up on the screen um Let's go look at the gardens. yeah i mean we have we're, we're talking about uh, spaces outside that that uh, would be pleasing for people to have, you know, if they wanted to have a little vegetable plot or uh, sit out in the in a the garden area for on a sunny day or have a family a family picnic. Who knows? There 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 are lots of options, but um, this is a space that we've been able to uh, gain for landscape rather than parking given the change of use. So that's um, something that uh, one of the benefits of, of senior housing. So I think um, that Sorry about that. Um, yeah, go ahead. I, I was saying just to um, somewhat build upon um, these, these plans, if you could, Scott, um, maybe uh, go to just even the next plan. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. The um, uh, go go uh, go maybe two more. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, this, this is good right here, actually, on, on the north elevation here. So um, as I had referenced in my introductory remarks, um, the intention for these six duplex units is to also include partial, not, not full basements, but partial basements um, in, in each of the six. And I, I think that um, this may be a good time. Um, Ambrose, if you would like to um, provide comments both as to, um, as we talked about the, the finger of floodplain on the Eastern two um, uh, duplex buildings, as well as um, then with respect to the construction of the, of the senior living um, and, and whether or not um, aggregate peers would, would be necessary. I think maybe now's a good time to kind of talk about basements and, and how that impacts or doesn't impact um, the surrounding community in terms of, of groundwater and then also um, just in terms of um, methodology for construction if, if aggregate here is required. What, what does that mean? Uh, I think that- Sure, like, sure. Uh, I mean, just, <laughs> just by way of brief introduction, I'm the president of McPhail Associates. We've been around for 45 years. We're located in Cambridge. We've done a lot of work in uh, Arlington, Cambridge, North Cambridge, Arlington area. Um, some of the projects in Arlington that you might be familiar with are Arlington 360, Thompson Elementary School, renovations to the uh, fire station, and we're currently working as the uh, geotechnical environmental consultant on Arlington High School. Um, we've done work in this area in particular in the past. We did a pumping station nearby at uh, Russell Field um, back in the mid 80s. Um, but the soil conditions are still similar. Um, based upon you know, what we expect for soil conditions out here, there's some fill material, probably five or six feet of fill material, some organic soils below that, and then a natural marine sand, marine clay deposit. Uh, groundwater is present down at a depth of about uh, six feet, five feet below ground surface, roughly around elevation two and a half to three ground surfaces at elevation plus eight to plus 10. Um, the basements are designed to be above, at or above the groundwater table, um, or the partial basements, I should say, are designed to be at or above the groundwater table. So we don't expect that they would have an impact on groundwater. We plan to design these basement areas, or I should say partial basement areas, as waterproofed. Um, such that they don't affect the groundwater table. Um, the slabs would be waterproofed and the walls would be waterproofed. Um, we would expect that the groundwater in this area, given that it's a relatively flat area, that the groundwater is relatively flat, that there is not really a significant groundwater gradient. And that means gradient is flow of groundwater. Um, that the groundwater is, is pretty flat in this area and pretty much models the ground surface elevation. Um, and as such, it, it may seasonally come up and may seasonally go down, but there's not a significant flow to the groundwater table. Um, as such, we don't think that these buildings really affect any groundwater movement um, in this area in that there really is not a significant groundwater gradient that's causing the groundwater to move. Um, the soils are relatively silty. The permeability of these soils is pretty low. Um, and as such, water does not move readily uh, through these types of soils. Um, it moves pretty slow. It's probably on the rate of a couple of feet per year in terms of movement. So it's not a, it's not like a, a river in, in terms of your imagination of what you know groundwater might flow might be like. This is more like a, a vast lake. Um, and I think probably at one point in time, this area might have been a large lake uh, going back in geologic time. But uh, and that's because it still looks pretty flat. Um, so I think if you visualize it as a, a more as a lake than like a river and that water really is not moving. It may go up and down seasonally, but it's not really moving significantly. Um, in terms of the foundation systems, as I mentioned, there's some fill, some organic soils <clears throat> over natural 
uh, sand and clay deposits. Um, we anticipate that uh, uh, we may well be able to build all of these buildings on a, just a spread footing foundation system, which is probably the simplest foundation system you can use. However, depending on the thickness of the organic soils, we may need to use some aggregate piers. Um, these are not pile foundations. I've heard that people are concerned about pile foundations. And I know that a number of the buildings on the other side of Route 2, not too far away, uh, use pile foundations. I might have been involved in one or two of those. Um, these are not pile foundations. It's when we use aggregate piers, basically what you do is you auger a hole in the ground that's probably about a foot or two feet in diameter. It goes down through the fill, organic soils, and maybe a foot or two into the natural soil, the sand and clay deposit below that. And then basically that hole gets filled with aggregate stone that is mixed with some cement to solidify it. And that gets tamped in place, similar to the way you would compact gravel if you were constructing a sidewalk or a roadway. It's the same sort of compaction effort that you would use. But we don't, we don't know exactly uh, you know, where we might have to transition from a spread footing to uh, an aggregate pier. But the aggregate, you would still use a spread footing. It's just the aggregate pier would extend below the spread footing to the bearing stratum. I don't think that's about all I've got if anybody's got any questions. I, I think if there aren't any, we can circle back at the end and, and perhaps move next to um, the update um, on the engineering and the civil. Um, there were two updated civil plans and um, the update to the stormwater report that um, I can turn it over to John Hessian now. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I also, as Scott said, I, I believe I can be uh, fairly brief this evening. Um, I have two, two revised plans to discuss briefly and to talk a little bit about a revised stormwater report that's uh, been submitted. Um, it was just, everything was just submitted this week. I, I fully understand that Beta probably hasn't even had a chance to look at it, but um, I, I could say that what we, what's been submitted substantiates what was presented at the last um, hearing back in, in May that, you know, I made a, a statement that with the reduced density of this development, the, the senior living with the townhomes, obviously from Gwen's uh, hand-drawn colored sketch, there's much more green area, um, which equates to more pervious area, less impervious area, that we, we were able with the previous multifamily project um, to, to make the drainage work and meet the stormwater management standards. And my comment back in May was that with, with this reduced density, uh, reduced impervious area that, that would likely have a fair amount of flexibility and, and be able to handle that. Um, so just the, the first plan here, the layout materials plan, um, actually very, very, you know, minor changes. This plan was updated and submitted uh, back for that May 13th hearing, the last public hearing. Uh, a couple of fine tunings on this. Um, there was a sidewalk added uh, to access the bike storage area. Scott, if you could use your cursor, if you would please, to um, the bike storage area on the north side of the uh, northeast side right there. Um, that was uh, mistakenly omitted. Um, from the, the plan in May. Uh, we've added the um, senior living building egress doors, um, obviously the main entrance. There's, um, a, and going clockwise, there's a door to the, to the loading, uh, loading dock area. 
there's an exit door from the garage level, the northeast corner, um, an egress to the south east, uh, uh, that's right, on the east wall for the uh, upper stories of the building, the southeast down there for um, the upper stories of the building, and then the last one, which is um, on the northwest portion of the building, uh, adjacent to the access driveway. Um, with, with the exception of those couple of minor changes, I believe this site plan is it really hasn't um, moved much at all. Most of the design effort was uh, with the architects this past go around, um, refining the, the senior living building, senior living building and the, um, the townhome or duplex townhome buildings. So the, the most of what I have to discuss really is on the, the updated grading and drainage plan, which is the next drawing, Scott. Okay, thank you. Um, so it, it, it was requested, I think it was requested in the kind of the closing remarks of the last hearing, uh, primarily by uh, Mr. Hamlin that he was gonna want to see, um, you know, that the stormwater management um, would work. So really the first step in, you know, completing an updated stormwater management design and report is, is grading the site and, and making sure the site can adequately um, grade to drain to uh, stormwater management um, structures and, and facilities on the, on the project. And the, the grading plan, um, although this is quite a different design than the multifamily plan, it, it has a lot of similarities in the grading and in ultimately the stormwater management approach. Um, the front portion of the site, really the duplex driveways and front yards will all drain to trench drains located in each of the duplex driveways with individual infiltration systems, below ground infiltration systems sized to handle the the runoff from the front yard areas and the and the driveway areas. Um, in the previous multifamily plan, we essentially had a trench drain going all the way across the, the frontage of um, you know Dorothy Road to pick up the courtyard areas, uh, both the, the passive courtyard area and the courtyard that contain the um, the the five or six parking spaces and vehicular uh, drop off and, and pick up area. Um, moving south on the plan, um, the, the townhomes and the, the carport roofs will be designed to convey runoff to the rear. There's individual downspout connections uh, that are dash lines from each of the, the, the duplex buildings um, that will connect directly to a subsurface infiltration area, which is that shaded area in the, um, under the, the access driveway that Scott is highlighting. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, and then if folks can remember the, the site section that Scott showed earlier in his presentation, there's a, you know, some grade change that happens. You know, the, the first floor elevations of the duplex units is, are elevation 12. The first floor, the residential level of the senior living building is elevation 16. So there's four feet of grade change from the duplex backyards to the front entrance of the, you know, the four story building. Um, and in that landscape area in between the, the backyards and the senior living building, we've got a couple of area drains and, and things are graded to drain um, to those area drains, the landscape areas, which will also discharge to that subsurface infiltration area, um, which I, I think it's important to know too. It's previously that infiltration area was a smaller footprint. It's the footprint has been expanded by about 50% and it was previously located under the parking that was to the west of the main site drive, which is now 
where there's going to be uh, outdoor, passive, recreation, garden areas to the left there in that area. Scott, thank you. Um, so we've moved that infiltration area further away from the neighbors. Um, and I think that's a, that's a benefit. Um, and then, you know, there's, the, there's an emergency overflow from that subsurface infiltration area that is routed around the west and south side of the senior living building and will discharge um, to the to the floodplain wetland area outside of the wetlands uh, but discharge um, to the south and at the rear of the um, building right there thank you scott um, i think you know ultimately beta we expect the the board is going to ask beta to take a look at this but we're we're confident that um, I think beta will agree that this system works similar to the previous design. A couple other um, highlights I think to make are with the raising of the senior living building, three feet raising of the garage level, it's allowed us to raise the site, which in, has also allowed us to raise the subsurface infiltration system providing greater separation um, from groundwater than, in the, than what was provided in the previous design. Um, and also with the reduction in impervious area, we have been able to incorporate um, the NOAA 14 plus precipitation data um, in this revised design. Uh, and just to, to highlight for everyone, the, the, um, the state standards, um, the, the town of Arlington wetlands regulations require the use of the Cornell rainfall data, which is more conservative than, um, than what is required under the stormwater management standards. Um, but there's been a significant amount of dialogue with the Conservation Commission and with the zoning board about the opportunity or the to address um, climate change resiliency to incorporate those NOAA 14 plus precipitation rates. Um, and we're happy to say that with this revised design, we've been able to, to do that. Um, so with, without getting into any more detail, I, I do think that the, the report uh, will prove out and um, you know, uh, look forward to uh, beta's review if the if the board requests that. Thank you, John. And then I, I think for the last piece of our presentation this evening, if we can turn it over um, to uh, Scott Thornton, um, he provided a, uh, uh, a an update on the traffic um, and how it relates with the with the new program of the duplex units and then the senior only building. So, um, Scott, I don't know if you need any visual, but um... yeah, that's fine. I can stay up there. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, again, for the record, Scott Thornton with Vanessa and Associates. Uh, we did prepare a, a traffic memorandum. Uh, identifying the differences in trip generation between the, uh, the previously proposed 176 unit uh, in the traffic study. It was analyzed as 176 units since downsized to 172 unit apartment building uh, compared with this new proposal uh, for the 12 duplex units and the uh, 124 units of, of uh, senior housing. Uh, so, so the, you know, I think the main takeaway is that um, this new proposal should result in about a third less traffic than the previous proposal. And uh, that, again, that's based on codes for ITE and the census data for the track that the site's located in. Uh, one thing I noticed when I was looking through the memo uh, tonight is that um, uh, some of the census percentages are, uh, are incorrect in the memo, um, but it doesn't materially affect the, the trip generation. 
or the percentage differences. I think we had in the memo, we talk about a 33 to 39% decrease in vehicle trip generation, uh, but using the correct census numbers, it's more like a 29 to 36% decrease. So I did want to I did want to make that um, make the board aware that that was um, and and that was just an oversight on our part. Um, in terms of the um, you know some of the other development details, um, it it looks like the you know it's a senior living with services uh, development. So there are going to be some staff on site. Could be uh, it's likely to be maintenance, uh, food preparation, um, uh, some laundry, housekeeping staff. Um, based on the information that we have, it looks like it'll be somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, persons on staff at any one time and, and probably less uh, during off-peak hours, uh, during, the, during nighttime hours, if, if, if there are any uh, during those hours. Um, the other item that, um, that uh, Art had mentioned was the... Um, the deliveries uh, for for food items and and other other types of uh, services or or materials that the site might need, um, we're expecting those to be transported to the site in smaller trucks. Uh, it's not there's there shouldn't be any of the of the large large tractor trailers coming to this site. Um, and those, as I mentioned, those can absolutely be delivered or can be scheduled so that the deliveries uh, will be made during off-peak hours. So probably looking at between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. so as to uh, present an even smaller um, load or a smaller effect on uh, the peak hour traffic conditions in the area. Uh, we also, you know, looking at the, at the, um, at the need for uh, for senior transport services, we reached out to the Arlington Council on Aging and uh, obtained some information from them regarding their services that they provide. There's a number of on-demand services that are available to residents in Arlington that are 60 and over. Uh, there's there's service that can uh, go anywhere in Arlington. Uh, the round trip cost of, of six dollars. Um, there's they also the council also contracts with uh, uh, with taxi cab providers for medical services for seniors uh, that need to go to locations that are outside of the town. So that service is also available. And uh, finally, there's a there's another service that uh, will transport seniors to council on aging programs uh, within the town. And that's, a, again, that's a, that's a nominal fee, it's $3 per, per ride or per round trip ride. Uh, so, so these types of services are currently available. And, you know, we contacted the, the council and the, and the transport coordinators, and uh, they, they made it clear that these services would be available to residents of the project that are over 60. Um, and again, with, you know, like many of the uh, other disciplines that were uh, discussed tonight, it, there's, a, there's not really much to tell in terms of traffic. We would expect that the, that the decrease in traffic would uh, have an even smaller, would, would result in an even smaller impact on the traffic flow and the, and the conditions of the intersections in the area. Um, so I guess with that, I will turn it back over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, at, at this point, if the board has any questions um, on, on anything that we presented this evening, we're, we're happy to um, give you our res responses and our, our feedback and uh, answer your questions. So. Um, Mr. Chairman, is there anything that you or the other members may wish to ask of any of the team at, at this time? Thank you, Ms. Kiefer. Um, just in advance of having the board ask, I did just want to um, ask uh, Marty Nova from Beta Group if they've had an opportunity to review any of the information that came in on Tuesday afternoon. 
Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, we did have a chance to take a look at the, the materials and we would be able to um, answer some general um, questions from the board um, on the new materials. We don't have anything in writing yet, um, but we would be able to answer some questions. Perfect, thank you. So then with that, um, I would turn to the board. Are there members of the board with questions? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Ford. Uh, I have a question for um, Mr. Donovan. Um, Mr. Donovan, one of the concerns that we have on this side is uh, doing work in the uh, floodplain buffer zone. And uh, I'm, so I really have a question for you about the excavation and the extent of excavation beyond the face of the building. Uh, I'm assuming the excavation will be laid back maybe at a, a two to one um, and assuming that, you know, the bottom of the footings are uh, 17 feet below finished floor, that the excavation could extend uh, maybe 34 feet beyond the face of the building. Is, is that what you would envision? No, no, I don't think so. I think, um, so for instance, the, the, uh, the main building, the larger building, I'm not sure what we're calling it, but the, the finish, the, the, the so-called garage floor level is at elevation plus six. Existing grade is at about elevation plus 10 in that area, I think. Um, we would expect that the footings, the foundations for that building would go down perhaps another two feet down to about elevation plus four. So it would be about a six foot cut, not a 17 foot cut to get to the bottom of footing grade. If we were to put in the aggregate piers, they're installed within a localized hole that's just drilled out and then filled with aggregate. So the, it's not an excavation. So I, I don't foresee any excavation to any kind of depth much greater than six or perhaps maybe seven or eight feet. Fair enough. So now if we go seven or eight feet down and you are you, uh, I would assume the plan would be to lay back the soil to the right of that building because, uh, and if so, how far would the layback happen? I'm trying to get, maybe my question to you uh, is, how far from the face of this apartment building would, could the excavation occur, assuming that you lay it back, lay the soil back as opposed to use any sort of uh, supportive excavation system? Yeah. I don't think we will need supportive excavation here. I do think it would be a layback. Um, two to one is probably more than what we would need. It would probably be more like a one and a half to one. In other words, if we're six feet below grade, we would be nine feet out. Fair enough. Okay, so maybe we're about nine feet plus or minus. And, and all right, th thank you. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman, I have a question then for Ms. Chapnick, I think. Uh, one of the things that I heard um, Ms. Kiefer say was that Ms. Chapnick had written a letter and that said that they were okay with the location of the basement that landed in the aura. Did I hear that right? Ms. Chapnick, can I ask you to comment on that? If I may just clarify what, what I stated. It, it was that the, the commission's letter of the 28th was referencing the, um, not the basement, but the, um, the, the portion of the building. So it, it includes like, you know, the garage and, and above that. So um, there, there's something separate speaking about basement. So I didn't want anyone to get confused because that was basements with the duplexes, but um, just to clarify. Thank you. Got it. So, Ms. Chapnick, maybe my question then turns to you that, that just says, we have a basement. I mean, the, the concern obviously is a building in the, in the aura, uh, and we've got a basement that sticks in the aura. I'll have, to, I'll have to ask the design team to tell us how far it sticks into the aura, but I know it sticks into the aura some dimension. Um, and from the face of that building, and I'm just going to use 10 feet into the aura. I don't remember the exact number, but for a reference, Assume that we're 10, the basement's 10 feet into the aura and we're another 10 feet 
to lay back the soil. Now we're 20 feet into the aura. Can you co comment on 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 uh, your opinion of this? Because you know, if we're trying to protect the the floodplain, it feels like we're starting to encroach. So I'd be interested to hear uh, your 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 viewpoint on this. Sure. Um, so the 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 buildings in the floodplain. It would be great if we had a picture of that. Um, where the floodplain is, the fingers of the floodplain. I don't know if that's something anybody can pull up quickly um, because it might just help with the conversation. I think it's right there. Did it show on any of the other um, plans? Uh, it, it should be part of the building. It, it should be on the building, not the duplexes. On the, you need to go further down page. Yeah, somewhere in that area. Okay, so you can see the, the flood zones. Um, they're very, very faint um, kind of gray area. Um, yeah, I think he's talking about the ones on the, uh, towards Dorothy Road though. Is that what you're talking about, no. Mr. Ford? No, on the back no, side of the building. you're talking about these that, down here. Yeah, everybody, if we recall, the basement isn't showing up on maybe it's this plan. And, and that was where the confusion lied before that the, the basement didn't show up on the floodplain plan, although the basement actually extends beyond the face of the building. So what we have is the basement into the into the aura. Mm -hmm. And and my question, and so I, I agree, I would like to see a plan. It would be helpful to see a plan that showed the basement encroachment onto the aura so that we can all get a sense of if you have the basement into the aura and then an additional 10 feet of excavation Beyond that, to, to get your opinion on the impact of that into our floodplain or our buffer zone. Right. Um, right. I did discuss, so based on the plans that we looked at um, from the last meeting and to the best of our knowledge from looking at those plans, and we concluded that there was approximately a 15 foot intrusion into the aura from the building. We had not considered any grading at that time that wasn't discussed. So we were unaware of that. All we talked about was the 15 foot intrusion into the aura. And we determined in the Conservation Commission that in consideration of the woodland restoration and other on-site mitigation that we were agreeable to this minor intrusion. And that's consistent with decisions we've made on other projects in the past. Uh, minor intrusion on the outer, the outer kind of 75 to 100 foot of the aura. However, we did not consider another 15 feet on top of that, 10 or 15 feet on top of that, Mr. Ford, because we were not aware of that. And, and I won't put you on the spot to answer right now, but I think it would be helpful for us to understand the implication of that in your in your opinion, you know, in light of the fact that we're learned, you know, that we understand that we're partially in the aura, the excavation is going to get laid back and go further into it. Does that give you any heartburn or should we have any concerns? Yeah, right, about right. That? No, thank, you. thank you for asking. I think generally, and the, the way we interpret it um, with the mitigation and the restoration that we've seen on site, that the outer 75 to 100 feet, so that 25 feet way on the out of the aura, that would be agreeable to us generally. Now, we didn't discuss that in the commission. We only discussed 15 feet, so I want to be fair about that in our public discussion. However, um, in terms of weighing um, the mitigation and the restoration on the rest of the site versus the intrusion in the outer 25 feet of our aura. Um, it's consistent with other decisions we've made. So that's a long answer. And the short answer, putting me on the spot, is within the outer 25 feet of that aura from the 75 to 100. I believe that would be considered agreeable given the mitigation that, that's happening on site. If it intrudes further into that, um, I think we're, we're going to have a little trouble because um, then, then we start being much more concerned about the habitat impacts 
and environmental impacts of that intrusion. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman? Uh, Ms. Keeper? Um, if I just may, just um, in, in case there's any confusion about various terms. So um, floodplain or, or bordering land subject to flooding um, does not have a buffer zone, just so mm -hmm. everyone understands that, that the floodplain is the floodplain. And then the aura um, is what normally one calls the buffer zone, um, and that is to areas such as bordering vegetative weapon, BBW or, or IBW. So um, th there's a difference, just if there's any confusion between floodplain and then um, impacts to buffer zone. Um, under the State Wetlands Protection Act, the buffer zone is not a resource area, but under, as we discussed, under your by, uh, wetlands bylaw, mm -hmm. um, the aura is, um, it is a resource area. It doesn't mean that no work is permitted within it, but um, as Ms. Chapnick was just referencing, um, but, but just in case there was any clarification or any confusion as to those terms. Thank you. Thank you. And, yeah, Stephanie, thank you. and Mr. Chairman, um, this is John Hessian. If I could add a little clarification to that, that might be helpful. Um, with your permission. Please. Um, Scott, would you mind scrolling to the next drawing, the grading and drainage, the same, kind of the same viewport you had. Yeah, great, there you go. So, um, and then can you, see that that is the 100 foot buffer or that's the limit of the aura. So that little semicircular wedge is the, footprint of the building that's proposed within the aura. And, and Mr. Ford, I, I thought I heard you saying that you, you thought that the garage extended further beyond the building footprint. That's not the case with this revised project. In the multifamily, the garage extended to the exact limit of this building, but the living um, spaces above the garage were set back about 10 feet. So it's the exact same amount of structure in the aura um, as with, was with the previous plan. And so that's the limit of the aura. And with respect to the layback area, whether that's nine or 10 feet, um, south of the building, you could see the, the asphalt, porous asphalt, walking path, which is centered on the um, emergency access, you know, emergency vehicle access drive. That is also within the R. It has been that way since the revised plans submitted on November 3rd um, last year. And we held that and when we first presented this revised um, development program, you know, we, we we indicated that we, we held that line, held the limit of that um, emergency vehicle access as our, as our limit of work, if you will, that we went no closer to the wetlands or no further into the aura than uh, you know, dating back to November 3rd. So the, the layback area that would be required for the um, foundation construction is gonna to be totally located within the limits of what is gonna to need to be uh, worked as the emergency vehicle access drive. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Anything further, Mr. Ford? No, no, that, that was it. And uh, 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 thanks, Mr. Hessian for clarifying that. I, I you're was, right. Uh, you're right. I, I had it misremembered, but the point I was trying to make was just how far off the building, the layback was going into the aura. But I, it, uh, as long as I think everybody, we all, including me, understand that that uh, it's common practice and, and acceptable to work within the 25 outer feet of the aura, and that construction doesn't extend beyond that, uh, uh, I'm okay. I, I just was, that, that was just been a point of, of discussion the whole time along. And, and as things move, you know, uh, it's hard to keep track of it all. So I just wanted to make sure I had it square. Yeah, appreciate that. And that's, that's why we tried to minimize movement on that to, to not have it 
be a moving target for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Javnik, you had a yeah. question? I just wanted to clarify one statement, Mr. Ford. Um, when you said it's common practice that we work within the 25, outer 25 of the aura, that's not necessarily common practice. It's just allowable um, by or agreeable to the Conservation Commission with appropriate mitigation and restoration on a site to balance out that potential impact. So I don't wanna have it on the record that the Conservation Commission agrees that it's always okay to work with in the out of 25 feet of the aura. That's not the case. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Understood. No, I'll stop putting, changing the, the terms and, and let you guys describe it. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, just to Ms. Chapnick's point, um, there's probably not a set um, number, but, um, you know, for instance, um, the Conservation Commission approved 19R Park Avenue that half of the building is within the aura. And I think it's, it's, it's even more than the outer 25%. So it's, it's, they're looking at each one, but you know, uh, 19R Park Avenue was a, a 34 unit building that there's a significant amount of work in the aura. So it's not, it's not an unheard of thing in Arlington, absolutely. No, certainly. Um, just a, a, a sort of a semi follow-up with Mr. Hessian. Um, is there regrading behind the building that impacts the amount of area in the floodplain? Um, there's a little bit of grading. The, you know, as Ambrose described in, in part of his comments, that on the back side of the building, you know, we're pretty much meeting grade. So there's some minor grading just to make sure that that um, asphalt walkway is accessible. Um, and just to create that, you know, the emergency, to level off that emergency vehicle access, but no significant grading. And what, what grading is in the floodplain has been included in the compensatory flood storage calculations. Perfect, thank you. Um, and just uh, one further clarification. So the, the porous asphalt that we keep discussing that's a part of the, the pathway around the building, is that, can you describe what that material is and whether it's something that um, is capable of leaching any any chemicals out of it? I can I can tell you a lot about it because the Canton Conservation Commission, where yeah. I live, required that I do my driveway with it. <laughs> so it, it's it's really it's a it's an asphalt um, paving product that really it's it's the aggregate. And the asphalt mixture, just like your own driveway or the pavement on the street, or if you have an asphalt sidewalk, um, and it what it's really missing is the sand. So water is able to just infiltrate through the 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 voids that are um, you know between the aggregate pieces of aggregate and the asphalt that's binding it together, and it. It's oftentimes referred to as popcorn pavement. Um, I will say, uh, you know, it's it's um, on my driveway. It, it's great. It it actually helps thaw. Um, ground temperatures travel up through it, so it helps um, reduce kind of snow and ice build up a little bit. Not a tad. Obviously, you have to shovel, um, but it it drains very well. And and there's just like any. Um, other paving product, it, it doesn't leach any um, hazardous materials. Okay. Hey, thank you. Um, are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Um, this is probably going to start off with, with uh, Mr. Thornton. Um, I noticed in the duplex analysis, we have basically assume a total of, of, I think it's six person trips uh, from the 12, um, the 12 uh, duplex units uh, in the peak hour in the morning. It, that, that is, those are the exiting trips. And in the evening, the exiting trips total, I think five, uh, two uh, through cars and, and two through transit. Um, and this, I gather, comes from uh, low-rise multifamily. And I'm wondering, 
it's it, that seems sort of little uh i'm guessing that maybe people living across the street might think that's a bit little and i'm assuming that the same ite generation figures that are applicable to these duplexes also would be applicable if you were called upon to analyze to analyze the two family housing that's in the immediate vicinity is is that right yeah yeah i mean that, those numbers are 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 right from the it manual if if we were to um if we were to run similar calculations for the or for similar units uh in the neighborhood we should come up with with similar numbers correct um so looking at the seniors i'm i'm, I'm a little perplexed um I take it that the that because they're senior, first of all, when the ITE does this, how do they define what a senior is? So so there are there are different categories of um, of of senior slash assisted living uh, uh, developments. And uh, what they go by are probably the um, you know how the sites are are categorized or how they're known. Um, so if they're if it's known to be a um, something like a uh, if it's known to be fifty five plus, uh, then it's then it's counted as a senior housing. Uh, then it can be counted as a as a senior housing development. Um, so there's there may be some that are that are higher uh, that have a higher average age or some that um, that are on the lower end, but they they should be 55 and over for senior housing. So I take it that the peak hour traffic generation when you're doing the independent living is is pro probably pretty sensitive to whether people are closer to 55 or whether they're closer to 90. Uh, I I would think so. That the data is not that um, is not that finely grained, so that um, you know when they when they do the counts of these facilities, you know they they do uh, they they get the they get the uh, the numbers of units for a development and count the driveways, and um, and. And that's where they come up with the, the trip rates. And you know they do this over over a number of uh, a number of developments, and um, and come up with with you know in some cases it's a weighted average trip rate. In some cases, uh, if the data fits well, there's an equation that's that's produced. But it it doesn't get the the data that they have to date does not get into uh, the level of specificity that you're, that you're driving at. So it doesn't, we don't, the data doesn't get down to the, to the level of the, of the ages of residents or, or how the trips, how the trips decrease or how the trips are, uh, are correlated with the age of the, of the residents. And so I, I would, I would think that, that the, the the older the residents are, the the, the fewer trips that they're that they're making. Um, but again, that's that's not something that's that's sort of clarified in the trip generation manual. So if if it's true that that it, it turns out that the that you're dealing with largely people who are say in the decade between eighty and ninety, as Ms. Noise I think indicated earlier. Um, those people probably are not on the average making as many peak hour trips as the general population of people 55 and over that would be fair to say i think that would that yeah that's fair to say i i would say that of the of the uh, of the categories that we looked at for uh for the for the senior housing component um there and again there's 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 four but th this the one that we looked at for this comparison generates the highest amount of of traffic for the number of units and again that's just that's just trying to provide a, a sort of conservative starting point um if we were to if we were to look at something uh, say congregate care uh which has a has a range of facilities or a continuing care village which has a 
has a range of, fac of facilities associated with it. Um, and you would think that they would have older residents there, um, the, the, the baseline trip generation drops down uh, even further. But again, we're, we're starting with a sort of a conservative base point, thinking that the traffic level should only, you know, if, if, the, if, the, number, if the ages of the residents are higher than 55, you know, 55 to 60, then the trip should go down. If there's, um, you know, if there's if there's some other uh, some other qualifier, you know, more, you know, more um, more of an assisted living than than independent living, then then the trips would go down. But again, lo looking at this as a independent living with services facility, uh, the the trips are the trips are lower than what we initially expected. So the now if but you take the same group. It's sort of conservative, I gather. To I, I'm guessing to take the trip generation figures you have, but the the transit mix seems to me to be the opposite of conservative because the, your mode split is based upon the the data from from the census that includes everybody who's all oh, commuters over the age of 16, and I'm guessing again that. 16 year olds will find the three quarters of a mile walk to the transit station a lot easier to deal with than the, the 80 year old. Um, and so probably, at least when you're just looking at the residents of the facility, uh, are, how confident are you of a 35% mode split? Yeah, and, and I think if, when you look at all the types of transit, uh, that are available, and, and again, we're we're specifically thinking of the of the the the, the council and the aging uh, uh, carpool vanpool type service, um, not necessarily the uh, the red line, but it could be that it could be um, uh, it it could be the, the the council on on the aging uh, bus transport that uh, that would would result in a in a higher transit level, um, you know, it may it may not get as high as as thirty five percent, but but again, I, I think that there's it 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 doesn't seem. Um, I mean, we're we're certainly not thinking that it would be anywhere near the 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 box on two uh, data, but uh, but but seems like it it should be something uh, akin to the to the existing census. Uh, track data in, for the area. The, is, the, is, the, is the applicant actually planning on, I mean, this may be for Stephanie, but uh, we're being, this is being described as senior housing independent living. Uh, that's, that's the category in the ITE manual and it's sort of independent living with services. Is, is, is this something that we should assume that that the applicant is committing to and that this is definitely what we're looking at? Or is this something that could change as market conditions change so that we should be conceiving this as potentially involving involving less, uh, less benign uses? Um, can, can I make a comment about that? Um, in conversations with, with the consultant that we're working with, um, we originally wanted to preserve the possibility that it would possibly have assisted living. In further conversations, what he's said is that right now, and maybe this is COVID related, the market for assisted living is, is way down and that the, the, the real need is in this uh, assisted living, I mean, uh, uh, independent living with services. And he's, he's, uh, uh, Quite confident that further, further investigation will market will continue. Studies. Market studies and so on will will, will continue to uh, bear that out. He's he happens to be um, uh, he happens to be very uh, experienced in the area and operates several facilities uh, within five miles of this site. So um, we're 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 pretty. Uh, uh, comfortable relying on his judgment about this at this point. 
Could I ask you, if I, if Mr. Chairman, if, while I have Ms. Noyes, I wonder if, if she could answer this. You'd indicated that that this the services would be sort of on an a la carte basis <laughs> and not included in the rent. And I'm kind of wondering what will happen with the affordable units and whether the people who have those units will be able to have their apartments, but will be unable to afford the services. Um, again, there's 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 a lot that I can be learning about this, but the, the a la carte is, it's not meant to, that one meal a day is considered part of what the, what the baseline would be, but things that are additional would be um, such things as transportation that we're talking about, or if, if, uh, uh, extra meals were wanted, that's possible. If there were particular um, uh, visits to doctors and or there, you know, there would be extra services that are, that would be available. Um, extra laundry, uh, you know, things like that. But th those would be bought by the residents, whether affordable of the affordable units or not on a market basis. Is that right? That's correct, but it is, so right. There would be there would be um, sort of a concierge capacity, but but people who are in the affordable category would have uh, a, a baseline of, of, of services that that uh, would be still uh, meals and and, and um, you know access to to health care and stuff like that. Okay. Could you could you remind me what the definition of affordability is for ownership units? I've I've now forgotten. Yes, yeah, Stephanie can answer that one. <laughs> um, Mr. Hanley, I'm sorry. The you want to know what the definition of affordability, affordability is for the ownership units? Um, it, it's for persons earning um, 80 percent um, or or less of the area median incomes um, as adjusted for household size. Is, does that so that's matter? basically the same as the rental system with the rental units yes and um if there's further clarification needed i, I think bob angler are you i'm here could you hear me yes yeah yes, we can yeah good. thank you yeah i don't know where my picture is but i'll answer uh, on the home ownership side the 30 percent of income includes mortgage uh, interest taxes insurance and any condominium or homeowner association fees when you add all those in, they can't be more than 30% of your 80% income. So when you're renting, you don't have condo fees, you don't have uh, insurance like you do as a homeowner. So effectively, your your rents cover pretty much the 30% that you're looking at, unless you've got a utility allowance, that's also included. So the, the rents and the utilities come out of your 30% as a renter, and on the home ownership, also the condo dues and then insurance comes out. So there's still a gap of what you have left to pay on an a la carte basis, uh, you know, because you have the 70% of your income left to cover those services. And it's worked out in most of the uh, affordable or assisted, or uh, I should say elderly with services, there are all, all the affordable components there are able to carry those a la carte services. Maybe you don't get all of them, but they get most of them. And you can ask around. Okay, thank you very much. I, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, thought I had a question. No. Um, are there other questions from the board? Steve Revelak, Mr. Chair. Mr. Revelak, good to see you. Yeah, good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks. I um, I'd like to just start by re by stating a couple of observations I made when looking through the Jan the January June eighth submission, just to make sure I have them clear in my head. Um, first is that you know we're still providing compensatory flood storage at a ratio between two point two and two point three to one, uh, depending on the elevation. Uh, the stormwater latest stormwater calculations were done using NOAA 14 plus rainfall data rather than the Cornell uh, data that was done earlier. Uh, the garage has moved up three feet. Uh, and the building main building's first floor elevation is 16 feet. Uh, so, which uh, 
I, I think is is are th things I'm I'm happy to see. And finally, the um, just a, a quick question, probably for Mr. Th or, or a quick question for probably for Mr. Thornton. Um, so based on the last traffic impact assessment, we're potent we're generally looking at a, a peak hour reductions of between 37 and 39 percent relative to the prior design, and that is without using a transportation to manage transportation demand management plan? Yeah, that is that is correct. Okay, and the prior one did use a transportation demand management plan, correct? Correct. Okay, uh, so one of the things that we discussed earlier on with the multifamily um, configuration was that, you know, the building would probably be electric, uh, fully electric, and I'm wondering if there's an intention to do that uh, with this uh, with the senior housing? Uh, this building would be uh, very energy efficient also. That's 100%. our intent, 100% electric. That's right. Okay. Very good. The other thing I noticed on the, um, the drain, or, well, one of the site plans, the duplexes have a first floor elevation of 12 feet. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. The, the, for this is, that's one of those numbers that happens to be important to me. Um, you know, just because I live in a floodplain and I'm conscious of things of, you know, where the elevations are. Um, Cambridge's uh, climate change vulnerability assessment puts the 100 year storm surge event in 2070 at 11.1 .1 feet. So I'm, I'm glad to see them at 12. Um, so finally, there are, I'd like to toss out three potential conditions um, for the board and Mr. Haverty to consider just, I'm tossing them out now is so, because I'm thinking of them now and uh, wanna you know, just get them down somewhere. Uh, first is that, um, you know, because we're planning on the duplexes having first floor elevations of 12 feet. I'm wondering if we could write that into the conditions that the first floor elevation of those shall be 12, no 12 feet or more. Um, my second request for a con thought for a condition would be that in the duplexes, the electric panels and all of the building mechanicals, the hot water heater, heating and cooling uh, be above the first floor elevation. And um, actually one final question, uh, the partial basements for the duplexes, would they be finished or unfinished? Unfinished. Okay. Um, all right, that's, I was, yeah, I was going to suggest that as a third condition that the buildings, the duplexes be constructed with unfinished basements, um, you know, at least, you know, for the first sale. But uh, if that is the plan now, I think that is, fine enough. One final thing. Uh, I know the service road around the building. In the past, we had modeled the turning radius of fire of the, uh, the town's ladder truck and to verify that it could get around. Have we, has there been a, uh, a turning radius analysis done for the, that piece of equipment to pull into the driveway near the main entrance? Thornton, um, that's for you or not? I think that's John or Scott. I'll, I'll take that. Um, yeah, the answer is yes, but we did a turning movement analysis for the fire truck has not been run on the main driveway. Um, trash and delivery vehicle mm -hmm. turning movements have been run on that driveway, but um, uh, the fire truck. Um, has not, that not intentionally, just, probably just an oversight. Mm -hmm. now it, um, if, if that could be done at some point, um, you know, it'd be a useful piece of verification to, to have. I could probably tell you before we run it that um, it's not likely that the fire department's largest truck is gonna be able to turn in that cul-de-sac area, um, but that's a relative, relatively short driveway and they would be able to to back to back out and and do kind of a three-point turn um, on the driveway but it's and then go around turning. the axis 
Yeah. Okay. No, no that's that's. I, I think that's entirely reasonable. Um, and that th those are all the things I had to. Uh, those are all the things I had to ask about and suggest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Revelac. Um, I did just want to follow up briefly with uh, with Mr. Haverty on the the three possible conditions that um, were just mentioned by Mr. Revelac. Um, one being including the the elevation of the first floor, um, the second being the location of electrical panels above the first floor level, and the third that the basement's being left unfinished. Are those kinds of things that we can include in conditions? So, Mr. Chairman, certainly the, the first condition um, is consistent with the plans that the applicant has submitted. So you're, you obviously can note that in your decision and include it as a condition. Um, the second one, I, I mean, I think that you have a legitimate issue of local concern that supports that. I don't know if that was the applicant's plan or not with regards to the location and the mechanicals. But it would seem to be wise to have them above. Um, Thank you much. Um, with regard to number three, I think that that, you know, is something you probably need more feedback from the applicant on. If they're planning on finishing those basements, then I think you know, we need to get some information as to how they intend to prevent flooding um, within those basements. And then just a, another question sort of to get back um, at an earlier question was, um, so obviously the, the use of the building that's included currently um, would be a part of any decision going forward. Um, and so if the use of the building was to be changed in the future, that would require a, a new decision by the board, is that correct? It would require a modification of the board's decision, correct. Okay. Perfect, thank you. And if I may interject uh, one Perfect. briefly, Mr. Question. I, I believe I heard Ms. Noyes say that the plan was to do unfinished basements initially. I think Mr. Haverty said finished, and I, I, I just want to clarify that it was unfinished, Ms. Okay. Noyes. That's correct. We, ha okay. we, in fact, we don't have really any plans for mechanicals down there anyway. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So, so that it seems like all three conditions would be appropriate and consistent with the plans that the applicant has submitted. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. Mills. <clears throat> yes, uh, I'm not sure who would take this question, but I find the drainage plan from the duplexes interesting in that all their uh, drainage would be routed to the infiltration system on what would be then another piece of property. I mean, if this was all going to re remain under the control of one entity, it would be not an issue. But now the duplexes are going to be sending their runoff um, across property lines to somebody else's drainage area. And how is that going to be work in perpetuity? I, I would see maintenance being an issue. Uh, I would see maybe deeded rights, that they would have this deeded right in perpetuity. Um, I would see easements being necessary. Um, could somebody enlighten me about how this will go forward legally? Ms. Kiefer? Um, sure. So I, I, I think, Mr. Mills, um, the... Um, it, it would probably be set up as a condo, so it would be um, a common area of the condo. But if you look at it as two separate properties, okay. um, you, you would have, um, as you referenced, cross easements, which are, are, are relatively, or, or maybe not a cross easement, but an easement, um, if you will. Um, and, and in terms of maintenance, I don't know if um, there's anything that, uh, John, you can provide further clarification on, but um, th those are... Um, I think abundantly easy things to to resolve, you know, to 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 paper, if you will, you know. Um, John, do you have anything further to add on that? In terms sure. of um, so there, uh, Mr. Mills, there there are no property lines proposed uh, between the duplex units. They are all on one lot um, based on the current plan. So as as Stephanie mentioned, they would be all six buildings 12 units would be part of a condominium so the the operation maintenance repair of any of the um uh 
drainage facilities, subsurface infiltration, repair the driveway if, and repaving of the driveway if, if repairs are necessary would, would be things that would, be have, would need to be written into the condominium documents, um, which is, would be common for you know, any, any other type of um, condominium development where there were multiple buildings. I'm all set with my questions. I would just like to add, uh, I for one appreciate the changes you've made to the design and try to uh, address some of the concerns of the town, the board, and in particular, the neighborhood. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Niles. Any other questions from the board at this time? So we have two boards. Oh, yeah. uh, just follow with Ms. Nover. Are there any um, any comments from uh, Beta in regards to the discussion we've had so far? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, at this point, um, we're going to provide written comments on the drainage and stormwater. Um, what was talked about by um, um, a few people on the um, the floodplain compensation, and as well as the work in the Aura. Um, we will be looking at the um, the compensation areas. They they the, the locations have changed, um, so we'll be taking a look at that to make sure that you know it is two to one compensation. And also, we'll we'll take a look at our notes from our original um, site inspection um, that um, we went out there and we took a look at the aura um, relative to um, you know existing vegetation and. Um, the wildlife habitat value out there. So we're going to make sure that, you know, the, the new floodplain compensation area, um, it, you know, is, is, is in the same location as the area we determined to not have significant wildlife habitat so that, um, you know, the compensation area can be planted. Um, so to provide, you know, better habitat and restoration um, of the area. So we're going to be taking a look at all that. Um, I don't know if Bill McGrath has any comments, um, level comments he wants to add on the drainage at this point. He did take a look at the plans and then, and then Tyler did take a look at the, uh, the traffic information. But again, we're going to be providing um, written comments on it. So, okay. Yeah. If I might, Mr. Chairman, just a, a couple of things. Um, the stormwater management system is similar in concept to what was done before. So I think we just need to verify that the uh, analysis is reflective of, of the proposed design. Um, we had suggested previously that some new test pits be conducted uh, just to verify the groundwater elevation in particular, because there was some variation in previous test pits. So I think that would still be a recommendation that we would make. And then just, um, on the, the question of emergency access, in addition to the, the driveway access, uh, I would also verify with the fire chief that he's comfortable that he has enough access to the entire front of the building uh, because there's probably more than half of it um, beyond the driveway. Uh, so I think it's, it's important that the, the chief is comfortable with that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. This is Pat. Please. Um, I had two quick things. One is that in the ACC letter uh, to us, like every other ACC letter we've actually had, we've been urged not to grant any waivers that relate to the kinds of things that the ACC is, is looking at, wetlands and so forth. And at this point, I've now gotten so much has been done to accommodate the uh, ACC's uh, original uh, comments. It's unclear to me what waivers are still in play. And I appreciate it if the applicant could look at this and, and we, could, we could figure out pretty soon uh, whether there's actually any disagreement left between the ACC and the applicant, and if so, exactly what it is so that we could focus on it next time. Uh, the second thing I wanted to raise is it, it had, I want to endorse the excitement of 
Mr. Revelak over the energy efficiency of the building and the commitment to use to make it all electric. Um, this is a really big deal in this town. Uh, it, we have a net zero plan, and this is uh, this is a big step in terms of actually achieving the objective of that, which of course is is tied uh, to climate change uh, and is an important part of town policy and a significant local concern. And I know this has been in the in the proposal for quite some time, um, and it never has really gotten the attention that it deserves. And I just want to do a shout out that not every applicant does this and not everybody who is building a new building does this. This is a, a pretty good commitment on the part of the applicant and they should be uh, recognized uh, provi for providing it. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. One last look around the board. Seeing none others from the Yourself, Ms. Chapnick. Thank you, um, Chairman. Uh, just if I may, I just wanted to make two clarifications. Um, one was um, the Conservation Commission obviously did not take a look at the new materials that were received this Tuesday. We didn't meet um, following that submittal. Um, we do heavily rely on Bader's review. Um, to assist us in our evaluation and, and generally agree with them. Um, so we will await their review um, and, and may have further comments or not, depending on that. We are um, concerned about the compensatory flood storage area, the calculations, because things have changed, as well as the location. So we, we would welcome that information from Beta um, and um, I just wanted to make a clarification as well from something that Ms. Kiefer said at the beginning of the introduction um, when talking about the uh, recommendation from the Conservation Commission that the applicant consider no basements, and I understand that's off the table now, and consider flood vents um, for, for the duplexes that are in the floodplain. And, and this recommendation was not necessarily for compensatory flood storage. We, we understand that. We understand this compensatory flood storage. We appreciate that the applicant has met a two to one at least um, compensatory flood storage on the site. We're talking more about flooding itself and, and a climate change resilience strategy. So I just wanted to, to make that um, statement. Um, and we have made that recommendation that the Conservation Commission has at other properties um, that have come before us that are within the floodplain. Um, and then the, the final um, point I want to make is another point of clarification. We um, appreciate that the applicant has managed to achieve the NOAA um, 14 plus precipitation numbers in their calculations for their stormwater management. We think that's awesome. That's really great. And actually, that's um, a change that's going to be made in our local regulations as a requirement. However, I just want to make it clear that um, Mass DEP and other scientists consider that the NOAA 14 plus precipitation numbers actually just represent the range of extreme weather events we are experiencing right now. They do not um, give you that extra climate change resilience. That extra climate change resilience, if you want to look ahead, that would be considered the NOAA 14 plus plus. I wish they didn't use that language because it gets confusing. But in, in simple terms, what that is, is if you go and look at the NOAA 14 data online, they give you a range. NOAA gives you a range. And the plus plus, the number that is climate change resilient for 2050, 2070, is the high end of the range. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you for the clarification. Yep. Um, so with that, I would like to transition um, 
to the public comment period. So just before we do, um, so in a moment, I'll be opening the public comment period on the this revised design for the proposed project. Public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting and to allow the inclusion of many voices. The chair asks speakers to limit their individual speaking time to three minutes and encourage them to use their time to provide comment related to topics at hand. Additional time will be provided at the discretion of the chair to provide time for questions to be addressed. Um, the chair encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board included in the record. This is especially true if you have specific recommendations in regards to the project. Procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us generate accurate minutes. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed. The board and staff will do our very best to show documents being discussed. If you'd like a specific document to be pulled up during your comment, please ask us to do so. So with that, um, the first name I have on the speakers list is uh, Matt McKinnon. Hi, good evening. My name is Matt McKinnon. I live at 9 Little John Street in Arlington. Thank you, please proceed. So I have a personal statement I'd like to read to you. Um, I want to make it abundantly clear. I agree with everyone who has been fighting against development on this land for so long. Uh, the Arlington Conservation Commission, the Arlington Land Trust, the Arlington Select Board, our state representative, Dave Rogers, and our fourth Middlesex District State Senator, Cindy Friedman, have all opposed development on this land. However, we're still here fighting, still putting up with the complete and utter lack of stewardship of this land. And it seems that all pleas to not build and all pleas to take care of the land have fallen on deaf ears. If this fight fails us, I have one more plea. No densely packed housing units, no parking garages, and no businesses in our residential neighborhood, please. I would still welcome our new neighbors living in the duplexes along Dorothy Road. This would be a reasonable addition to our neighborhood, provided that the land is adequately cleaned up prior to any construction. That is all I have to say. Thank you very much for letting me speak tonight. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, Mr. Urowitz. Hello, can you hear me? We can, sir. Good, my name is John Urowitz. I live at 47 March Street. I'm a 53 year resident of the town. And I go back many years opposing any and all development on this Muga property. We've won every time. 2016, 17, and 18, going through the meetings at the town hall, the library, the Hardy School. We've always had meetings where we've been very energetic in, against the development. The whole neighborhood, Kelvin Manor, all up and down Lake Street, no one wants this. The select board doesn't want it. Something happened between 2019 and 2021 all we're talking about now is they're going to get one meal. We've got porous pavement. We're going to cut a couple of feet off the roof. Whatever happened to our against opposition to development? Why are we still talking buildings? We want no buildings. I firmly oppose any development for the negativity it provides to the neighborhood. It's an invasion in our neighborhood. You're going to change our groundwater. Those infiltration setups are going to just push the water through the ground further. The roof drains are going to put water out into the back. It's going to be insect borne. The fire department can't get in there. The fire department can't get down our neighborhoods fast enough. 
We're going to be getting three years of construction with the invasion of contractor trucks, big concrete trucks, bulldozers. We're going to lose our green space, animals. It's just, there's nothing good that can be said about this. I do not want, know why the zoning board is considering building all this stuff in any, in any size, in any quantity of, of units or people. I, I, I want to go on the record as being very against any kind of development on this site. And I wish the ZBA would shoot this down. Thank you for your time. I appreciate this. Thank you, sir. Uh, next on the list, uh, Ms. Keith Lucas. Good evening, Chairman Klein. Heather Keith Lucas of 10 Mott Street. Thank you for providing the time for public comment tonight. I do maintain that it's not appropriate to build on this land. It is a wetlands and area uh, that I remain concerned that flooding and the other local concerns may not be able to be remediated from any type of development here. Having said all of that, uh, my understanding is the ZBA uses the formal document submissions from the applicant to assist you in making sound decisions for projects that are under consideration. There have been many changes to the plans and also corrections that are made verbally, including one tonight about the traffic study whether or not that's significant or not is, is up to you. What I'm worried about is that members of the ZBA will not have accurate information to reference as they make decisions moving forward. So Chairman Klein, my ask of you is to consider requesting of the applicant to resubmit materials that also clearly highlight the inaccuracies from prior submissions. So you and your team have clean documents to use in your review, and to also consider asking the applicant provide you a side-by-side -side comprehensive summary of all of the changes that are made out of respect to you and your team so that you have clear documentation to make sound decisions by. The next are, I have two questions if I may. Absolutely. Uh, would the applicant be willing to describe any differences between the design and the building material plans for developing what I'll call the, the standard buildings versus the affordable housing units? Um, Ms. Kiefer or Ms. Noyce, I don't know who would be better for that question. Hi. Um, the um, uh, under the 40B uh, regulations, um, the exterior of the buildings are required to be exactly like, indistinguishable. Um, Thank you. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, that answers my question for the exterior. However, the interior, I would be concerned about the structural integrity of the building as well as any water permeability that could occur to the unit as well. Um, thinking about the three conditions that Mr. Revelick had posed as well, if, if those would also be applied to those affordable housing units so that those who wind up being owners of those uh, affordable housing units are not unduly impacted by poor quality build mm -hmm. uh, and therefore incur additional costs in the maintenance of their homes. Okay, thank sure, you. I'm sure if I can have you address that and then I think I'll ask Mr. Haverty to make a comment as well. The, uh, the quality of the workmanship it remains the same. Um, and, and so in terms of flood proofing and whatnot, it, that's, that's not changed. Um, the 40B regulations allow for um, like um, interior sorts of like maybe the choice of countertop materials that those are not required under 40B law to be exactly the same. But, but in terms of the quality of the construction itself, those would be the same. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I speak to this also? Ms. Noyce? Yes, I mean, it, it is our practice that 
the quality of all the units will be the same. The finishes will be the same. There will be no distinction between affordable and unaffordable. <clears throat> Uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, Mr. Haver oh, sorry, I just wanted to ask Mr. Haverty if he could just mm -hmm. comment on this question as well. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. I mean, it sounds like the applicant is committing to having all of the finishes be the same for both the affordable and the market rate units. <clears throat> However, the subsidizing agency is really the entity that has oversight over that issue. They, they do allow some differences in finishes between the affordable units and the market rate units. They are required to be indistinguishable from the exterior. Um, in terms of building quality, you know, they still have to comply with all of the state building code requirements. Okay, thank you. So you're saying essentially from the, from the outside, they have to be indistinguishable. Uh, from the interior, the applicant has stated that they would want them to have the same finishes, but that, um, it would be up to the subsidizing agency um, to enforce it. Is that what you're saying? Is that, am I hearing that correctly? Correct. Um, the, the subsidizing agency has the authority to allow the differences in the finishes between the market rate and the affordable units. <clears throat> that's an issue of programmatic concern that's within the, within the exclusive jurisdiction of the subsidizing agency. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Keith Lucas? Thank you, Chairman Klein. I have one final question, Please. and that's whether the affordable housing units, the, there's one section that I believe we talked about of, of that front duplex housing units where one, one side is more prone to flooding than another. And I'm curious if the affordable housing units will, which how, how the decision will be made of, of whether they're affordable housing units or the normal retail, if you will, uh, units would be in that space. Ms. Keeper? Uh, I, I think that the answer to that is that they're all being designed that they're not going to be subject to, to flooding. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite certain exactly which which units she feels are, are prone to flooding. Um, but the the design is that they're, they're not to flood. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that the that it had been identified in the flood maps that the, the units that are toward the eastern end um, are in an extension of the existing floodplain. Is that correct? Oh, yes, there is that, that finger that goes through the, the eastern two buildings. That is correct. And so I think the question is, so those two sites, you know, given the existing conditions, would could be considered more prone, prone to flooding because of the, the existing conditions of the site. And so I think the, the question that's being asked is, um, how, how is it determined which units become the affordable units? And, um, you know, I think the concern is that those would be the ones selected for that purpose. So there will be 25% of the, of the duplex units are, are going to be affordable. So there will, there will be an affordable unit in there. I, we can say that, um, the affordable units are generally interspersed throughout um, and with respect to um, the, the, the those two easternmost being within the, um, the the finger of the floodplain, I think maybe um, John, if you want to add clarification as to the flood proofing, if you will, or. Is Ambrose still on? Ambrose uh, went off. He is doing the call. No, I'm I'm still here. Yes. Can you can you respond to that? Well, I think it's a floodplain issue. It's not a groundwater issue. Right. That's correct. So, so I, I, this is John Ashton. I can I can speak to that. So today, that area is floodplain. That little finger. It's very shallow, less than a foot. Generally, less than a foot deep of floodplain. But our proposal is to fill that. That's part of our floodplain impact. So we're gonna remove that area from being floodplain. We're gonna take that, the volume of flood storage that will be lost and replicate it at a two to one ratio uh, a little further to the south. So we're essentially removing the floodplain, relocating it and building those two easternmost duplex buildings 
on similar high ground to the rest of the frontage along Dorothy Road. So it, it may be flood blame today, but once we, once we fill that and with the grading around the building, those, that, that flood elevation will not come up to the building or under the building. Great, thank you, Mr. Hudson. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Keith Lucas. Thank you, Chairman Klein. I appreciate your assistance with the clarification of my question. I have no further comments at this time. I defer to my neighbors. Thank you so much tonight. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, Ms. Ide or Mr. Ide? Hello, this is, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Nicholas Ide. I live at 152 Lake Street, which is the corner of Lake and Little John. Uh, so I, first of all, of all, I want to acknowledge that uh, you know, there have been changes made to the plan and those do seem to be in a positive direction, but I have to admit that sitting in these meetings, it, it's a kind of lather, rinse and repeat. So tonight we've talked about the floodplain, we've talked about how the water doesn't move and there's a lot of assumptions. I mean, I, a question for Mr. Donovan is how his explanation of how the water doesn't move and it sits still meshes with the water that gets in people's basements. I don't understand that, but that's, I'm not a geologist or a hydrologist or any of that, but we've talked about the floodplains. We talked about the fire truck, whether the fire truck can actually get where it needs to and turn and access where it needs to access. We talked about the ITE traffic study and whether that is actually valid and meshes with what actually happens in the neighborhood. So theory is great, uh, practice is even better. And I think that there's always a lot of assumptions and there's a lot of suppositions that come up on this call where people explain things away as, yes, that's how it should happen. Well, sure, <laughs> plans are great. Reality is a different thing. Uh, today, we didn't talk about the WB67 trailers, which were mentioned last time. Uh, these units for green stacks come in on the WB67 trailers. How in the world they make it around the corner of Lake and Little John and into the neighborhood without running over everything, I don't know. I would love to see a, a video of how that happens uh, and how they get nine of those or whatever it would be in a day on an hour by hour clockwork basis with dealing with John's landscaping and everybody else that has businesses and parks and everything else. It's, it's amazing. All of this is leading up to what I'd like to say, which is, you know, I think that in the past when this site came up for construction, it got shut down by the town, by the ZBA, by the locals, et cetera, et cetera. What's different now is 40B. And 40B allows for certain dispensation, certain changes, et cetera, et cetera. I really feel like every time we're in these meetings, what I hear is us pushing the envelope of what is possible in a practical sense, what is physically possible to be done on that site, what is allowable within the bounds of 40B, and it's all in the spirit of what is profitable for the landowner and the developers. They're running a business. I, I understand it. Someone has land they've owned for 50 years. They want to profit from it. Someone has a business they want to profit. I completely understandable. I, I understand that. However, the spirit of 40B is to get affordable housing in. And I don't see us maximizing on the affordability. I see us maximizing on the profitability, but not on the affordability. We are not maximizing on the amenability. Every meeting, people stand up and they fight against this because there are so many things that we are so worried are not going to go to the cookie cutter plan that is laid out and that these suppositions that are made might not come true. And it worries us, which leads to my last point of the thing I worry about, which is whether it is sustainable. There is what you build on day one, and then there is what happens to it. So you build an unfinished basement. Someone buys it and they finish it and then they have problems. You build things with certain intent and then there's what people do with it, right? And how things evolve over time. I heard someone say about that we would micromanage the trucks that come in and out. So I don't know if someone is gonna be on a contract in perpetuity to make sure that no large trucks come through the neighborhood to deliver anything to the, to the, the housing unit. So I, I find it very troubling. Uh, as always, and I've written letters to this effect, and, and I agree with the things that my neighbors say. I very much appreciate the things that Mr. Hanlon says and, and some of the other speakers, uh, whose name I can't remember at the moment, but uh, there are many people on the, on the ZBA who are uh, very proactive and say things that, that, that we as, as neighbors wish we would have said, and we're so happy that you say them, and we appreciate that. And to be honest, you know, if, if this weren't a 40B project, 
it would probably just be a bunch of townhomes like Mr. McKinnon said. And there would be no complaint with that. They're townhomes, it fits in the neighborhood, but that's not profitable. And that's why no one wants to build that. And so we are pushing the envelope of what is possible. We are pushing the envelope of what is allowable simply for the sake of profitability, not for the sake of the affordable housing and more affordable units for people, not for the sake of what the community is amenable to, and not for the sake necessarily of what is sustainable. I, I don't see how it's all going to be sustainable. Hopefully they're going to hire somebody to clean up the wetlands, to keep them nice. I've heard, I've heard someone on this meeting before explain how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars it takes per year to keep those wetlands in proper condition, which has not been done for 40 or 50 years. I would love to see that done, but how is that sustainable? Is that part of the sustainable plan? That is all I have to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so just to, just to, um, wanted to just follow up on a couple of those questions. Um, in regards to the, the truck trailers, I, I believe Ms. Mr. Thornton, you had provided, have you provided diagrams on those? Have, Yes, I, yes, we did provide those diagrams. Okay. So hopefully those should be available on our on our website to con, to confirm them. Um, and then, um, so the, the 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 question about the sort of the, the maintenance of the remainder of the property. So this is the, this is an ongoing um, an ongoing concern that the that we're working on. So currently, there's an effort between the town. Um, to and the the applicant and the board to discuss um, <clears throat> specifically how to address this in conditions um, in a way that is enforceable uh, through and beyond the 40B process. Um, it is a little it's a little bit tricky. It's very unusual, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, but if I could ask uh, Mr. Haverty just to just speak to this uh, briefly. Paul, sorry to catch you off guard here. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> you wanted me to speak to the issue. Uh, of... Just a, just a little bit about so the the board and the town and the applicant have been discussing how to address um, the remaining portion of the site beyond the uplands that's being developed. Um, and I sort of commented that it's 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 tricky because it's not part of a normal 40B process to do this kind of. Um, you know, wetlands uh, doing the testing and doing the, you know, um, doing work to try to restore the site and some of the, you know, the other outstanding issues on the, on that portion of the property that are very unusual in a lot of these cases. And I just wanted to see if you had anything specific in regards to um, sort of how the, the board can work this into the, um, into the decision in a way that you know, addresses the concerns that have been raised locally, but also is enforceable moving forward. Sure, and, and so as I think we've discussed previously, um, you know, the board is limited in the types of conditions that it can impose in a comprehensive permit decision to the types of conditions that other boards would be allowed to impose um, under local rules and requirements and the local permitting processes because the Board of Appeals is acting as all other local boards as part of the comprehensive permit process. Um, some of the, the ways in which the, the board really wants to make sure it is ensuring um, the cleanup of the remaining area to, to be put into a conservation area sort of goes beyond what may otherwise be allowed to be included in a comprehensive permit decision, but the applicant uh, has made an offer in terms of financial contribution to the cleanup of that area. Um, and they have also made commitments with regards to what they wanted to do in terms of getting that area cleaned up. So the idea is that, you know, the board would obviously include some conditions um, in its decision that would address this, but also hopefully be able to do a separate side agreement, to sort of a memorandum of understanding with the applicant that sets forth all of the terms and conditions that the applicant is willing to do with regard to the cleanup and, and long-term maintenance of this area. So it's sort of a belt and suspenders approach. Um, it does require the, the cooperation of the applicant. And is the, is the board able to specifically 
um, <clears throat> condition, you know, various aspects of the construction project. So, in, like in terms of issuance of, of permits and things like that, are we allowed to condition things that would be covered by a memorandum of understanding as applying to uh, the the main process of the of the permit? And again, I think that, that it, it presupposes that the applicant is willing to live with any such condition that the board includes and is not going to appeal that to the Housing Appeals Committee. I think that if we're in a situation where the board is reaching a little too far in its decision and the applicant decides it's going to appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee, then it's going to be more difficult to get that sort of condition upheld on an appeal, whereas if the applicant is agreeable to whatever provisions the board includes in the draft decision, you know, then you're in on much sturdier footing. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Ide, anything further? That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I have uh, two issues that I'd like to address. The first one is parking. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, last month, the applicant um, was justifying the reduction in the number of parking spaces by the fact that half the residents were going to be in assisted living and probably very few of them had need of cars. Uh, now that we're back to 100% independent living, um, I wonder if the 86 spaces in the garage is sufficient. In particular, there are only four handicap spots in the garage. And with an average age of residents expected to be above 80 years old, I suggest that four spots for 124 apartments is not nearly sufficient. And I hope there'll be some consideration given to increasing the number of these labeled spots and their dimensions. Uh, the other issue was a question that I asked last time and no one knew the answer. Um, that is that our bylaws require the posting of a bond to protect against to protect against flooding problems that arise in the first five years. What I'd like to hear from the applicant is whether they tend to honor this bond or whether they're going to be seeking a waiver of this provision. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Um, to take those two in order, um, the, on the, the parking question, um, Ms. Kiefer, I don't know if this is specifically for Mr. Thornton or, or uh, Mr. Hessian, but um, switching from having half assisted living to being all independent living, how does, how does that affect the, um, what the anticipated parking demand will be and how is that being addressed? Uh, thank you. I, I think maybe first we should um, turn it first to, uh, I think, Scott um, to address um, the parking yeah sure so i think that the the um you know the so if we've got 124 units and uh we've got 80 86 or so spaces in the in the garage um so that's that's about point uh 0.6 space ratio so um so there there's we need to uh probably set up some type of um, of system uh, to which which uh, Gwen and Art will need to identify as to the how the spaces get uh, get released to to the residents. Uh, again, you know, with with some of the older residents, we would expect that they, you know, they're, they're that so, while some may come with their cars and may not use them, there's likely to be a lot of residents who, who don't have cars and who would not be expected to be, uh, to be driving, uh, particularly those that are, you know, that are, um, you know, in the, in the, in the upper ranges of the, of the, 
um, of ages that we would find at this type of site. Um, but I, I think that that's it's a it's a good question, and I think it's it's something that we uh, that needs to be uh, worked out with um, with the senior living consultant so that we have we make sure that we provide the adequate spaces for uh, for the residents and also for the staff that are going to be there. I don't know if Gwen or Art, I don't know if you have anything to, to add on that. Uh, uh, yeah. okay. Oh, there we are. <laughs> I guess that was beautiful. So talking to our consultant about uh, the fact that many, many of the, uh, of the tenants, the clients in this kind of facility, they, they do bring their car along and then not use it. So to discourage that and taking up a, a space, uh, one of the things they sometimes do, I guess, is to start charging uh, a fee for holding a parking space. And uh, obviously that <laughs> encourages somebody to think about whether if I'm not using a car, why indeed am I uh, keeping one there? So that's just uh, one one thing and uh, to keep in mind. But also one of the services would be um, having uh, a jitney right. service uh, be be the way in which taking several people to go shopping and so on at the same time is part of what is anticipated as a service. Thank you. Um, and then the, the, the question about the ratio of um, accessible spaces. I, I know that I don't believe the either the the state architectural access board code or the the federal ADA have different ratios depending on, on age group. Um, but I think that would be something else to discuss with uh, with your consultant as to whether that, you know, that is an appropriate um, distribution of spaces. Um, and then as, as was discussed previously, the expectation that there would be between 10 and 20 um, employees operating on site um, does that eat into the, the 84 to 86 spaces that are planned for residents leaving, you know, only, you know, 44, 46 spaces that would be available for residents? Yeah, and, and Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll take that. I, I think it, you know, we're, we're, we're expecting a certain range of, of, um, of, of staff there. Um, but we would we would not expect to have um, uh, you know twenty would be at the at the upper upper range and that's sort of a, a full time equivalent so so we would expect you know over over a twenty four hour period there may be as many as twenty employees that have that have come to the site and and gone I, they wouldn't be there uh, for the for the entire day and during during the same hours uh, but but absolutely it, it is you know we, we we do have to make some space for those um, for for staff and and maybe it's maybe it's 10 spaces maybe it's 15 spaces uh, that have to be made available and and I mean there, it would it would take away from the total but again I think as, as Gwen mentioned the you know the the availability of the of the type of service, the van pool service, the council on aging uh, demand service. I think that reduces the, um, the the propensity or the or the requirement for for residents to have cars on site. And we would I, I think we would encourage uh, uh, people to not uh, not bring their cars to the site because it's just you know it, the, the vehicles aren't going to get used and and there's there's no reason for them to. To come, but it, it's absolutely something that we need to put some more thought into. Is there specific differentiation between spaces that would be allocated to the residents, to the employees, and to the guests? Yeah, I I think that the the surface spaces would be mostly for uh, for guests. Uh, there's still I believe there's still ten spaces that are that are proposed at the surface. And um, and other spaces, you know, there'd be staff spaces and um, and the resident spaces in the garage. Mr. Chairman, could I add one other? Look, Phil, please. Other, yeah, thank you. Uh, we, uh, as I think most of us may remember, we had parking spaces um, 
at the at the west end, which has now become gardens and kind of a uh, an area to be outside, enjoyed by the by the residents and that sort of thing. And I think there were we we felt like we had enough parking. Uh, but as Scott said, we can go back and take another look at this, but it, it is a function of, uh, of trying to pre preserve that public space. Uh, what all do we have there? We had gardens sort or of a croquet court and some things like that. Flower too. gardens, vegetable garden, lawn. And I, you know, we'd like to keep those for obvious reasons, but uh, if they're required for parking and we feel that, uh, so there is kind of a backup, you know, even, you know, if in year five in the project, you, you say, oh my God, we need more parking. Uh, there, is, there is a way to, to back into that. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Pat. Um, I just want to emphasize the special problem of handicap parking. Having, as Mr. Seltzer points out, uh, four handicap spaces for uh, 124 octogenarians is probably not enough. Um, and I just want to encourage us to look specifically at that and, and whether we have spaces of the right kind. Um, it also seems to me that this is the first I've actually heard of the Jitney service. Uh, there had been mentioned earlier of services provided by the Council on Aging. Um, but you know, this is a, the parking is a problem. It's a, it's a broad, it's a problem with lots of facets to it. Um, and I think that, that I just encourage the applicant to provide some information to the board on what is, what they're proposing as part of the solution to that problem. Um, I, I think there may have been a reference that a Jitney service may be one of the things that, that is one of the services provided here. Uh, and I may have just overlooked the importance of that, but really, you know, all of this needs to get to get summed up so that we understand what all the facets of the solution are when we think about what the local need is. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, and then to get to Mr. Seltzer's second question, which was about the uh, the posting of the bond, just. Um, Ms. Keeper, I can't recall if that's on, if that's addressed in your list of waivers or not. Um, so I'm, I'm not entirely certain what Mr. Seltz or what, what bond he's referencing. Um, however, um, relative to um, a, a local bylaw relative to um, work in public ways for construction or, or whatnot, uh, we had asked for a certain waiver with the exception of bond. So I'm not entirely certain what he, which bond he is referencing. So if, if, there, if it's a different bonding thing that he's thinking of, and, and sometimes people get confused with, um, or, or they, they cross-reference kind of like bonds if you're doing like subdivision roadways, which wouldn't be applicable here. So I'm not entirely certain which, or what specifically he's talking to for a bonding requirement, but um, for the work within public ways that there's a, a bond requirement, we had not sought a waiver for, for the bonding requirement. I guess if I could just raise the question with Ms. Chapnick, um, is there a bond that is a part of the, the conservation bylaw that? Sorry about that. No. Um, yeah. Um, there is, you know, we've been talking about that in the other 40B, and I think Beta has a better handle on this than I do. Um, I'm not sure if Marty remembers, I can look it up, but there is one in the local bylaw. Um, and I'm not sure if the applicant has asked for a waiver of that because to tell you the truth, I, I've lost track of which waivers or what. Um, Marty, do you, do you yeah. remember that? I, I, I do know that the other 40B has asked for the waiver of that, but I don't recall that they've asked for a waiver of the bond in this one. Yeah, so I don't remember either. Um, yeah. and, I, and I do appreciate Mr. Hanlon ask, or whoever asked for an update of the waivers. I think it is important mm -hmm. that we understand what's actually being requested now that the projects change so much. Um, certain waivers may not be necessary. However, I, I will state that uh, the, the Conservation Commission is very reluctant to waive that bond um, because that bond is kind of insurance on making sure that the um, 
the mediation and and you know the wetland mitigation is done correctly. So, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, I was fairly specific last month when I asked this question. Um, I did specify specifically Title V, Article Eight, Section Eleven. Uh, which seems to apply to this project. And I was assured at that time that they would look into it and have a response um, to that. So I'm disappointed that uh, that it hasn't been looked into. And as Ms. Chabnik said, I think this is something that's really important um, since flooding is a major issue and we're being assured that it's being handled properly. And this, the bond is sort of putting your money where your mouth is, uh, uh, you know, guaranteeing that you are coming up with a good solution. And if you don't, and in a couple of years there are flooding problems, um, you're expected to um, take care of them. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Uh, Ms. Kiefer. Um, hi, um, thank you. and. Um, I think at the last meeting, I, I didn't have the waiver list with me, um, but that provision was requested a waiver from that um, within the previously submitted waiver list. And um, um, as um, a couple of commenters have referenced it, as well as the suggestion by Mr. Hanlon, um, you're absolutely right. And we are intending to update the waiver list. Um, I think that with the presentation last month, with the revised concept, obviously it was too premature. And then um, the updates today are from Tuesday that were submitted that we are discussing this evening. I think we're in a good position now to um, get that update to the board um, to reflect that. And, and I believe that the reference was was dealing with the um, with the uh, um, the local wetlands bylaw and a, and a waiver underneath that. Um, and, and again, this uh, it, it it has been requested. Um, and, you know, under 40B, um, th there shouldn't be a distinction drawn between affordable housing projects versus um, uh, non-affordable housing projects. So, if it's a um, if it's a if it's a common practice that the commission imposes um, for every development, then um, you know they may not wish to waive it at this time, or may not wish to encourage the board to waive it. Um, but um, it, it it has been requested, and. Uh, I think that responds to your comment. Thank you. Um, is there anything further, Mr. Seltzer? No, thank you. That was the only two issues that I wanted to raise. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Point of, uh, information, point of information, yep. one question. I was going to say, uh, I'm wondering if the next person on the list. Oh, well, then <laughs> I, I'll stand <laughs> mute. Thank you, sir. Please, please proceed. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Steve Moore. Uh, I live on Piedmont Street. I was unable to join uh, with Zoom tonight, and I'm not very familiar with how the, uh, the telephone raising of hand works. So I'm glad that that worked out. Um, yes, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, I wanted to applaud the uh, applicant for including the McPhail organization uh, on their analysis team. I'm familiar with their work and have been um, uh, very uh, um, impressed by, by the thoroughness of their work and the completeness. Uh, so I think it's an excellent addition to the team, particularly in this very sensitive area when it comes to groundwater and uh, flood stormwater. Um, my one question for them is, as the excavation is accomplished, if it's discovered that conditions on the site are different than what the analysis currently says it currently is without having done the excavation, is it possible to still change the remediation approaches uh, and the foundation uh, Im implementation to reflect the changing site conditions when the facts on the ground prove to be different than what currently is thought is going to be there? That's the first question. Let me go ahead and ask Mr. Donovan if he can address that question. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit of a hypothetical. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, like I said earlier on, we anticipate some fill material, some organic soils, and a natural sand and clay deposit beneath that uh, at a depth of probably like six to eight feet below ground surface. 
if that if it turns out, for instance, that the fill is thicker or that the organics are thicker and that the bearing stratum is is deeper, it would basically the foundation system would stay the same. The aggregate piers would become deeper. They would extend deeper into the ground to support the foundation system. So the, 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 the spread footing foundation system itself would stay the same. It's just the piers would that extend below that would be longer. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, an additional question related to that. Um, I'm, I'm more concerned about discoveries, unexpected discoveries about the water table. The, uh, you know, the water table, if the building is designed as, a, or is being designed as a waterproof partial basement. I mean, the, the, this basement is barely below grade and it's being designed as waterproof. So if the water is any different, it really, it doesn't make a difference to the building because it's waterproof to resist letting water come into the building. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, my, my point is more at, I'm sure the building will stay relatively dry. I'm more concerned about the building's impact on the neighborhood and what happens to all the basements which are nearby as water is displaced or discoveries are made about groundwater which are remediated to keep the development dry, but then uh, has implications for the neighbors. Yeah, I'm not sure I really understand how that would possibly happen. We're not, okay. the building is being built above the water table. It doesn't displace water. This is not a ship going in the ocean. This is basically, if you think of this as a lake and it's a very, the water table is a very expansive area. It doesn't affect, it doesn't, Putting a building on top of it doesn't affect the groundwater and make it come up. Water, you've heard the, the saying water seeks its own level, that water yes. levels out over a very large area. And this is a very large area and the size of the building is very small and it's above the groundwater table. Okay, I, I defer to your expertise, sir. I, I, don't, I don't know enough about ground mechanics and hydraulics I'm just wanting to make sure that if the water table is discovered to be higher than expected in places, it doesn't impact the rest of the neighborhood, which sits also in the same floodplain. So, right. uh, well, thank, thank you. And you're right, it's all hypothetical. We'll, we'll have to see. That's, that's my first question. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The second question is, when you were talking about the permeable asphalt for paving, yeah. Uh, when, when that was being discussed, they were saying it was a mixture of uh, aggregate and asphalt, and it lets, uh, uh, there's no material be leaching from the material itself, but clearly uh, water and anything the water is carrying can move through it to the ground, including all the salt and that kind of uh, situation. I just wanted to uh, understand that that's normal expectation, right? That yeah, salt, salt and water will move, but that'll be pretty much it through this permeable pavement. Okay, thank you Does for that. Does anyone um, have a... Mr. Hessian, is that your expectation as well? Yes, it is. And I, I would actually, you know, um, we would likely include a, a note on the on the design plans or you know in the operations and maintenance plan. It, it may be in there. I don't have it in front of me. Um, but to not not allow the use of salt or sand on the, that portion of the, the walkway that is porous, which is only the portion of the walk the walkway and sidewalk system that runs around the south and east side of the building. Okay, I think that's a that's a smart move, uh, Mr. Chairman, to make sure the porousness of the material doesn't get filled up with sand and, and such. Um, third question is the use of, um, you were talking about the use of the space currently, we're talking about uh, senior, uh, senior uh, facilities plus uh, duplexes. 
And somebody made the comment, I don't know who it was, about how that if the use was to change, what would be required is a modification to the use plan. I don't know anything about how that works. Could someone fill me in to how complicated a modification is to do and how long it takes and, and what it would do to the existing plans if a modification was suddenly desired by the applicant? Mr. Haverty, can you address that? <laughs> Certainly, Mr. Chairman. So a, a modification is allowed pursuant to 760 CMR 56.0511. Um, and the standard for granting a modification, first, the, the board has to make a determination as to whether the proposed modification is either substantial or insubstantial. If it's insubstantial, then it's just deemed approved and you don't have to go any further than that. If the board determines that it is a substantial modification, um, it's then required to conduct a public hearing with uh, duly noticed um, hearing for, for butters. Um, and then at which case it needs to determine whether or not the grant of the modification um, or the denial of the grant of a modification would render the project uneconomic. If uneconomic. Yeah, correct. So if, the, so if the board determines not to issue the, not to approve the modification, and the applicant took an appeal of that, they would have the obligation to show that either the modification, the denial of the modification renders the project uneconomic, or if the project is already uneconomic, that it is substantially less uneconomic with the modification than it is without the modification. Right, right, that makes sense. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I, once, the, uh, once the project is built, and is it possible for the use to change then after it's built and the units are rented and sold and then the owner decides they want to use as part of the space for a different use than was originally planned under the 40b permit does the zba have to approve that yes change they, of use they would yes so, so well mr chairman again the, once it's up and running um, it's much more difficult to get a modification that would render the project uneconomic i mean if it's already going and the project is already successfully operating, um, it's very difficult for an applicant to be able to prove that a denial of a modification renders the project uneconomic. And there is some housing appeals committee case law on that issue. Okay, so it's not, so sir, it's not just uneconomic. Uh, it, it, it isn't, uh, I guess the word would be less profitable as opposed to more profitable. Uneconomic is the key term, right? It's correct. Okay. And there's two Thank different you, that, standards that, based upon either a rental or a home ownership. And this is a combination, right? Okay. Correct. Um, and the last question was, Mr. Haggerty, this is a point that you had made. Um, the, the, the point of 40B is to consolidate all of the various boards and commissions that would weigh in on project, uh, project uh, specifications and such. Um, does that include the Board of Selectmen? Does the Board of Selectmen have any role in this project once for it, once the ZBA approves or let's say the ZBA hypothetically approves it? Does the Board of Selectmen have a role? So to the extent that the, the, the select board issues local permits, those are subsumed within the comprehensive permit issued by the Board of Appeals. Okay, so any any issues then, Mr. Chairman, that would come in front of the select board, and thanks for correcting that. I still make the mistake and call them selectmen. That's wrong. Um, the select board uh, is uh, subsumed by the ZBA's decision. So I would have to assume that any discussions related to the dealing with the rest of the parcel and who's going to pay for the cleanup and how much, you know, whether or not the offer is large enough and correct to sustain that cleanup post the, the development being complete. Mm -hmm. The selectmen usually would weigh in on that. The ZBA is going to weigh in on that. And I assume that conditions that the ZBA would put on or potentially would put on the applicant related to that would be in place of the Board of Selectmen. So I think they would have a relatively wide range of conditions that they therefore could put on related to the maintenance of the property post-development. Just, just to clarify, to the extent that there is a separate memorandum of understanding between the town and the applicants, that's really sort of, although tied into the 40B process, it's, it's really outside of the 40B process. So okay, I understand. 
I don't know off, off the top of my head whether that's something that will be executed by the Board of Appeals or the Select Board um, or some combination of both or whether it's the town manager. That That's really not a question I think that, that's capable of being answered at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but in okay, terms well, of the well, issuance of local permits, uh, that's all within the purview of the Board of Appeals. The Board of Appeals is all local permit granting authorities under Chapter Okay. Okay, Mr. Harrigan, I appreciate the extent of your knowledge and the fact that I ask some sideball, sideways question that you don't have off the tip of your, tip of your tongue is just fine. Uh, not, not to worry about that. And uh, finally, I want to say, uh, I haven't heard the term jitney used in a while, and I'm wondering if that's an official development term. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, that term. Thank it, you, Mr. It Chairman. may be now. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Moore. <laughs> Uh, next on my list, uh, Ms. Brown. There we go. Hi, Patricia Brown, um, 49 Mary Street. Good evening. Hi. A um, couple of questions. We keep talking about partial basements. Are we talking crawl spaces or are we talking like half of a basement with full height? Let me get a quick answer on that one. Um, Ms. Noyce, can you address that question? It would be half of a basin full height. Okay, um, thank you. Second question, the more, when I first read this, this proposal, it sounded like it was senior housing with services such as food service, medical services, housekeeping, things like that. Now it's beginning just from all this presentation, it's beginning to feel like it's just age restricted housing. Can you give me a better sense of what you anticipate? When I think of senior living, I think of people having a common dining room with food service, with um, uh, medical services, nursing staff, things like that. Can you give me a better sense of what you're anticipating? Ms. Weiss, can you address that? Uh, yes, I, the, the optional services and amenities, this is a draft, you know, we are um, a, a little bit getting ahead of ourselves, but this is what they, our, our colleague has uh, sent as a, as a draft. Staff, uh, optional services and amenities, residents will have available certain optional services and amenities subject to availability at additional charge, they will include staff escorts to outside appointments, private transportation in the van, uh, personal clothes laundering, extra housekeeping services, guest meals. Um, but I should say that the, 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 the um, uh, resident services here, the, the project will provide seven day per week security concierge coverage. This will include screening visitors and vendors, mail and package drop off, dry cleaning pickup and delivery, assisting residents with the scheduling of taxis, local restaurant reservations, local entertainment and, and social activities and other community involvement. It's also possible that basic errand running and local shopping package pickup will be offered to residents on an optional basis. The service will provide site security and interface with municipal emergency service personnel. So this is this is not meant to be, we're promising all this right now, but this is typical of what um, this uh, uh, service that or, or operation that we've, that we're, that we're talking about. Um, emergency response. The project will inform residents of their and their families of locally available emergency response equipment and service providers. Um, social and recreational project will include common areas within the project to promote community and social recreational opportunities. Local clubs and service organizations will be invited to use the project community space for gatherings and meetings in order to promote continued resident involvement in the greater community. The project will likely provide exercise areas um, as well as an outdoor walking trail for residents to maintain level of activity that promotes health and general well-being. Okay. In addition, that's, I mean, I can go on. Um, uh, let's hold it, let's hold it there. Okay. 
That's <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. So, so none of that is what I think of typically as senior assisted living with food, with food preparation, medical uh, staff on site, nursing staff, yeah. things like that. This is this is more age restricted housing than with some you know with some community stuff, but it's more age restricted housing than senior assisted housing. Is that, that would be a fairly uh, I, well. I I didn't go through the whole list, but a, a meal dinner would be provided also. Um, so you do a food service. There would be a food service. All right. Uh, yeah. Just one meal a day, you're saying? Uh, I think. <laughs> well, no, but I'm I'm trying to get an, I'm trying to understand the extent because my my thinking is if you have if you've got food service one meal a day, it's a different amount of staff coming in different amount of food being delivered um you know going back that that's that's where i'm going is not you know like what you're serving for meals but what i'm thinking is you know do you have staff doing food deliveries that are you know for 150 people three meals a day seven days a week is a lot different yes so I, that's what i'm trying to understand is what you're how you're envisioning this so it's called independent living with services and uh, the services do include one meal. And I believe he, that, that he said that there are things like, uh, you know, some kind of a buffet breakfast could be available. Also people can ask if they need more, more service, they can, they can get it, but that everybody will have a kitchen at, you know, so that if they want to cook, they can. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I think, as I said, this is something where we haven't gotten very far into that. We're, we're uh, still working with the CBA about uh, what's possible. Um, but if, if, uh, if we keep moving along, we'll be defining these things much more clearly and doing a study that will get into exact details of what this particular community needs okay. and would like to support. Thank you. Can I, can, following up on that, please, for, for people moving in, do you envision this is going to be more senior luxury where there would have to be a buy-in, like on assisted living things, or is this going to be strictly um, more affordable, middle-class affordable apartment, or are these going to be high-end rentals? Go, I'm going back to 40B. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that there's any sense that this is going to be high end, but it's going to be a, a, a pleasant place. <laughs> you know, You're talking um, in terms of cost, not in terms of amenities. I, that I can't say. I don't know. I don't know what the. Uh, you know, it. Um, it's, not, it's not going to be high end, but but it will be. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, there's competition in the neighborhood of, in Sunrise is there and, and Neville Manor is in the area. And so it, it will have to be uh, working within the same kind of market range, I believe. Thank you. Ms. Brown, anything uh, further? Yep. Will Arlington residents and neighbors get priority in terms of um, any kind of um, ability to move into this? In terms of the affordable units or in general? In terms of the affordable units, yeah. Mr. Haverty, can I ask you to address that point? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, what was that again? So the, 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 the question was raised about the affordable units and whether they can be, whether there are certain set asides for Arlington residents. So the town can have up to 70% uh, local restriction. Um, but that is, that's a not to exceed number. That doesn't mean you're guaranteed to be allowed to have that level of a local preference. And it's something that has to be approved by the subsidizing agency. Um, so typically what I'll do is I'll include a provision in a decision that'll state that the local preference shall be up to the maximum allowable 70% subject to the okay of the subsidizing agency. The subsidizing agency is going to require the town to provide information that supports the need for the local preference. Um, and I'm sure you know, that Arlington will have you know, a substantial amount of information that will help to um, support that. 
usually it's, you know, if you have a housing authority, it's got a, a waiting list of people that are looking for apartments or um, single family houses or condominium units, um, whatever it may be. That's usually the sort of information that the subsidizing agency would be looking for. Um, and presuming that you're able to satisfy subsidizing agency that there is a legitimate need for that level of, of uh, local preference, then we'll be able to get the 70%. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Hanlon. Could I, I, I don't, I would like to, at least have stated, I think I did last time too, for the record, not every member of this board is excited about local preference. Local preference in a town with a 3% black population is has an obvious problem with it. Uh, and I understand that the purpose of the 70% maximum is to address that, um, but I'm not entirely confident that it does do that. Some other communities like Brookline have reduced that percentage. So I just encourage us not to take it as a, as a given that we would either ask for any of it or uh, that we would ask for all of the amount that, that we might be entitled to if the, uh, if the agency were, uh, the, the uh, subsidizing agency were, were to agree. Uh, so all I can say is that at least as of right now, for this board member, at least it's, it's an issue and I wouldn't tonight wanna give any assurances that that's what would happen. And Mr. Chairman, the concerns raised by board member Hanlon are very legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, they're something that the board should take into consideration. Okay, thank you. Ms. Brown, is there anything further? Last, last question. The, on the affordable housing, um, the, the um, ownership, is it going to be a one-time affordable thing or will they have an affordable deed going forward so that the next person who's buying that unit would also be able to afford it? Mr. Haverty? Mr. Chairman, there, there will be a, a, an affordable housing restriction that will be placed on the, the unit and they will be uh, deed restricted as affordable in perpetuity. Great, thank, thank you. you. The deed restricted as affordable. Anything further, Ms. Brown? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hakeem? Yep, hi, uh, GM Hakeem, 10 Edith Street. Uh, I'm wondering, um, seeing that the building's footprint uh, extends into the uh, aura, um, the buffer um, area, um, what is preventing the applicant from reducing the footprint of uh, reducing the footprint of the building so as not to infringe upon that area? Um, Ms. Kiefer, is that a question? You have uh, someone to ask that question of. Um, well, I I think that um, the uh, the design that's been provided. Um, there's been a lot of work that's been put into this um, and we're really talking the, um, you know, exterior 15 feet of a small portion of, of the aura. Um, and as John had referenced, the, uh, the impact has, has been around since um, on the plan since November of, of 2020. We're not increasing that amount. So if there's any confusion, um, just so everyone understands on the board that th there's no increase into the amount of structure within the within the aura um, and, and as I'd referenced previously um, there are um, a, a number of projects in the town that that have a substantially greater portion of the building within the aura this is this is on the on the grand scheme of things it's it's pretty minor and I'm not trying to um, you know minimize um, the town's decision to make the aura a, a, um, a resource area under its local bylaw, um, but just to know that there is flexibility. And in terms of the like, design of the building itself, um, I'm not going to profess to speak to that as eloquently as probably uh, John or, or Scott or Art and um, the architects and the engineers on it. So, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, can I um, just Please. ask? I mean, the the, the idea that the 15 feet um, that you mentioned, Ms. Kiefer, is uh, insignificant um, uh, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I could just also say that it's just as insignificant to remove that 15 feet. I mean, that like logically, that would be basically the same argument. So 
um, just the design of the building? Is there a reason like, um, you know, like the profit basis or um, like the floor plan, or is there some reason why that the building had to be planned in that area if it was just, just as easy or insignificant that it could have been left out? Skipper, I don't know who, you know, in, in doing the site layout would be able to, I don't know if that's a question for Mr. Hashen or not in terms of the site layout and staying beyond that line. Man, I, oh, yes, this, is, this is John. Um, uh, I'll start, but I, I think, you know, maybe Scott and or Art can chime in from, um, you know, the, the building is designed as a, you know, if you recall back when Scott had the floor plans up, it's a, you, you know, a, a center corridor down, you know, the middle of kind of each of the wings of the building with, you know, residential units on either side of that corridor. So kind of a, a, a double loaded corridor, if you will. Um, you, you know, it's not easy to just kind of chop out that 15 feet, you know, then you'd end up really losing the units on that south side. It becomes inefficient. This is where I think Scott and Art could, you know, chime in. Um, very inefficient for construction, taking that down to the lower level in the, in the garage, the basement level. Um, again, it's a 62 foot wide bay, which allows you to have head in parking spaces and a 24 foot dry aisle. Um, it, it really, trying to just cut that area out um, does have a significant, you know, constructability and efficiency of construction um, component into it. And um, so maybe Art or, or Scott Blasek would like to weigh in on that. Uh, Scott, go ahead, Scott. Okay, I, I was gonna just uh, say, I, I think John did a great job kind of outlining the, the main issues there. So the, um, I agree, the floor plan, um, you know, would become somewhat inefficient. I think the other thing that, uh, you know, maybe we could have looked at was pushing the whole building closer to Dorothy Road, but, um, we really wanted, it was very important to us, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Art, to, and John, to keep the building as far back from Dorothy Road as possible. So balancing those two factors, I think what we decided was to favor uh, the distance of the building from Dorothy Road, uh, given that uh, perhaps, you know, just going into the ore, that uh, small distance uh, seemed to have been discussed um, you know, previously and, and was, as John had outlined earlier, was always a part of the multifamily proposal. So that's kind of how in this scheme we came up with uh, holding that line. Uh, uh, that, that, that's my, uh, my take on it. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And definitely, I think the, um, the, the townhouse or the duplexes um, shielding that building from the road is, is the right choice. Um, so just to be clear, the, um, the loss of those units, if the building were to be moved out of the aura or to just to carve those units out of the backside of the building, would that um, make the construction not profitable um, for the applicant? Well, I'll just add my two cents uh, to uh, John and Scott did a great job of describing this, but the um, to come back to the basics of laying out a building of this type, you have a double loaded quarter, uh, and as I think Scott said, that's 62 feet. Parking vans are about the same, and they they actually fortunately fit together, so you can have parking uh, below a standard building layout. And I think what you're suggesting is maybe you could take out one side of the parking or one side of the corridor, and that would you, you, that couldn't be done, not not to make any kind of uh, financially viable building. You, you'd have kind of half a building. And if you push it the other way, of course, you, you try to keep your, your uh, corridors and uh, your building layouts and your parking layouts, then you push toward Dorothy Road. And that means that you don't have room for the, um, for the duplex townhouses, which of course was our whole point of uh, is actually taking off a lot of the uh, 
uh, the the northern parts of the building to, to put in the townhouses. I, I'd like to add that we appreciate that how important it is to uh, to recognize the hundred foot buffer zone um, that Arlington has, and we've tried very hard to do that. Um, it is uh, uh, not unusual for the there's a really uh, in the bigger scheme of things it's a it's a sliver of land that has that is uh, has been uh, carved off and um, as Ms. Keeper has said earlier in this hearing um, a, a recent project uh, had considerably more area carved off and, and we it is our intention to do a lot of landscape restoration, uh, woodland restoration and this, over years uh, in this project. And it seems like in the larger scheme of things, the 200 and some square feet that are involved is really um, not, a, not a, a very significant incursion. And maybe, maybe Ms. Kiefer could, could repeat uh, her investigation as to uh, the the um, extent to which it's been recently uh, a similar, but I think, I think we, we, get the, we get the understanding of it. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you for your answer to the question. I I uh, I I understand um, the points made. Some of them are logical. I I don't think that. Well, another project did it, so we can do it too. Is a good justification. Um, some of the other reasons given do, do seem more justified. Um, not that one, uh, but I appreciate your detailed answer. Anything further? No, sir. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Houston? Uh, hello, uh, Shona Gibson, 107 Mary Street. Uh, I'm at the end of Mary Street by Little John. I wanted to share with the ZBA my perspective as um, a nurse practitioner specializing in care of the elderly for Cambridge Health Alliance. Uh, I spend um, a lot of my week going in and out of assisted livings and independent living buildings. So I'm very familiar with the uh, folks um, who live in these buildings. I wanted to share my perspective that uh, most people are not moving into these types of buildings unless they have, um, they're, they're becoming frail in some way. I don't see many people moving in at the, at the younger uh, end of the age range, the sort of closer to 60. Um, most folks I see are, are moving in kind of over the age of 75, or if they're younger, it's because they have some sort of health condition that's very commonly a trigger for people to move housing. So I wanted to maybe just point out to people that um, it's quite possible that uh, the population of this building is, is quite frail, if not immediately upon the building opening, at least within the first few years of it being opening. That's just a, a sort of a typ typical scenario. And so the reason I point that out is that uh, people naturally as they age often need more services. I've heard some of the services listed. Uh, I can tell you from my experience of, of close to 20 years working in these types of buildings that uh, folks will require three meals a day being provided. Uh, very infrequently do people actually use the cooking facilities in their buildings, in their apartments. Some do, uh, most don't. Some end up having their um, appliances in their kitchenettes actually closed off for safety reasons. That's not uncommon. Uh, many people require a lot of assistance with uh, personal hygiene, bathing, etc. A lot of people require assistance with laundry. Usually there has to be common laundry areas. People have to have aid services coming in. Um, some of these services I've heard will be provided by the building. I know in the independent um, building, sort of that is called a, uh, independent living with services. Um, that is, um, I found to be a little bit of a notional 
difference between assisted living and independent living. I think it often is, is intended to attract a different type of clientele, but people kind of age in place and end up needing more services than the building might provide. Then those services end up being brought in by vendors. I just want to point out that, that um, it, it does create a, a constant flow of traffic, perhaps not high volume traffic, but a constant flow of traffic all day long. Um, home health aides, uh, people getting rides to and from doctor's appointments or other's appointments, certainly family members. And um, lastly, I think the last thing I would just mention is also quite a significant volume of emergency service visits. Um, people fall, people have medical emergencies, for one reason or another, emergency services are called. They often arrive at the building with blue lights flashing, the police come first or the fire comes first. Eventually the ambulance gets there and the situation gets taken care of. I just want to point out that this happens either day or night. We're tucked in a little corner here um, with no um, direct access onto a major um, major street. So all these, uh, all these um, cars and vans and emergency service vehicles obviously will be coming through the neighborhood. Um, I think that's just another reason to reconsider uh, whether a building of this size and scope uh, should be placed in this location. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, there are three names uh, on the on the list, um, and all of them have spoken before. So I'm just trying to figure out if you're have a second comment, which I would ask you to, to limit your time on, or if you just left your hand up by accident. Um, so I will start with, with Mr. Ide. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, just a quick follow-up. So I mentioned the WB67 and how it, uh, that trailer would get around from uh, Lake to Little John, and it was mentioned that that has been posted. Could you please tell me where I would find that, what the name of the document is, and what date it was posted with, please? Great question. Um, Mr. Thornton, can you go ahead and forward that that comparison to me? I can't recall if it was specifically something that you had submitted to be posted, or if it was just something you displayed during a meeting. Yeah, that that is a great question. I will I will look for that document. Um, okay. I believe we sent it to the town as um, a response to Beta's comments. I'm just not sure which. Uh, which set of comments it was included in, but I will I will look for that and send that to you. Okay. Did we discuss that at the pro at the previous hearing? It wasn't the previous one. It was probably maybe the one before that, or or even two before that. Okay. And so the reason I brought it up is my recollection was at the last hearing uh, on May twenty seventh. Um, it was mentioned that I think it was still an, an open issue that. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. It may be, a, it may be attached to as to the agenda for May first. I'm just thank you. trying to recall off the top of my head. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, as long as Mr. Ide is up, he had mentioned in going through a list of of issues uh, that he was laying out a question about how it's consistent to say that this is really just a lake and the groundwater doesn't move, but at the same time, everybody knows there's lots of flooding that is going on and the water is coming from somewhere. And I imagine that there are probably a lot of people who have that question. And I wonder if as long as we're here, somebody could, uh, Mr. Donovan or Mr. Hessian or whoever uh, could explain why it is that that makes sense. Mr. Donovan? Uh, sure. You know, it's very, it, it's hard for me to comment on people's individual houses and what might be happening there. But, you know, a lot of this from my experience is uh, it's rainwater. It's the depth of people's basements and it's the design of the slab and the material underlying the slab in these basements. And if they have a sump set up, how that is set up, how deep it is, how well it's connected to uh, drainage materials underneath the slab and around the building. Uh, I've 
been doing this for 40 years. I've looked at a lot of people's, you know, basement drainage issues and all of these factors come into it. Um, and one of the most common ones is rainwater coming down next to people's houses. Um, that seems to be one of the most influential factors. Uh, yes, groundwater can be a factor, but rainwater, when you see water coming into your basement pretty soon after a storm, more than likely it's a result of rainwater than groundwater. When water falls on the ground, it takes uh, some time before it reaches the groundwater table. It's not immediate. Um, it's not even the next day. It may be a week later before it actually gets to the groundwater table and affects raising the groundwater table as a result of rainfall. So I, I, I can't tell you why these people are having particular issues at their houses, but we've, the way we've designed these particular buildings is to be above the groundwater table and to be waterproofed such that water isn't coming into these buildings. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if Mr. She Mr. Hessian has also been living with this issue now for about a year, and I wonder if he has anything to add to that. Sure, Mr. Hessian. I mean, with, with respect to that um, specific question, Mr. Hamlin, I think Mr. Donovan, you know, answered it. Um, and just as an anecdotal story, um, my house where I live, I am, my basement is basically right at groundwater, just above, the slab is just above because I did an addition and I have a sump pump pit that I never have to use, but I can see the water. But I lately have been having water come into my basement after heavy rains because I had a downspout problem and the water was discharging right at, close to my foundation and migrating down and, and then into in at that, you know, at that place where the, the foundation wall and the foundation and the basement slab join. Um, it's you know limited, but um, I think Mr. Donovan, you know, his I he said it much more eloquently than I have been able to do over, like you said, over the past year that I've been living this. Thank you. Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I think that, that one of the comments that has been made uh, by neighbors, and I, I live far further away, I don't see it as much as they do, but um, beyond rainwater getting into people's basements from their downspouts or what have you, the street actually floods. Um, you know, so there, there is water that comes up and lays on top of the space on the side of Dorothy Road. So I, I don't want to get into it too far, but, but thank you, Mr. Hamlin, for bringing that up. It's a, a great question. I really appreciate you digging into it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Keith Lucas, I wasn't oh. sure if you had a second comment or if your hand was just up. Thank you, Chairman Klein. I do have a second comment, if I may. Uh, Heather Keith Lucas of 10 Mott Street. Mr. I had previously brought up the concern about maintenance on the property. I'd also like to address the safety on the property. The town of Arlington and surrounding towns has spent significant resources, uh, both financial, personnel, volunteer hours from the community to support the homeless people who reside on the applicant's property. This is a complex public health problem. It's a community problem that requires sensitive and thoughtful, humane approach. And the applicant has made a financial proposal that ties converting a portion of their property to conservation while also using the 40B to build a financially lucrative business for their client. Converting a portion of the land to conservation and building on the remainder does not address the needs of the people who are homeless that have lived here for so long on the applicant's property. And there is um, heroin use, there have been fires, there have been explosions. Residents for a long time have expressed a growing concern regarding a situation where someone would get hurt. 
And I want to make sure the applicant is aware of the recent alleged assault that was made on our own Officer Kniff last week. Officer Kniff allegedly had a weapon drawn upon him. And due to his excellent training, he was able to de-escalate this situation. Commendable police work. Later in that situation, multiple rifles were found during a search of the area. So I wanna make sure the, again, the applicant is aware of these ongoing and escalating safety concerns. From Mr. Haverty's prior comments, I understand that contingencies such as maintenance, and I imagine and hope that would also expand to safety uh, contingencies are dependent upon the applicant not appealing such conditions. Irrespective of whether the ZBA approves the build in, in any particular way, I implore the applicant to engage in ensuring the safety and security of the neighborhood and residents to, to truly engage in good faith discussions about the safety and maintenance um, and to consider, have the ZBA consider conditions in collaboration with the applicant to reasonably address the safety of the neighborhood, both current residents that include those people who are homeless and living on the applicant's property, as well as our potential future neighbors as well. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Chairman Klein. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moore, I wasn't sure if you had an additional comment or if your hand was just still up. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I don't know how to, on the telephone, put my hand down. So my my bad. Thank you. No, no. It's, I admit I haven't the faintest idea how you would do it either. So <laughs> well, let me try it. I've done it, gone ahead and done it for you. Um, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. That didn't. I got Never it mind. You. I got it for Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tionolio. Hi, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? I yes. can, sir. Yes, I'm Diego Janolio. I live at 85 Dorothy Road. So on Dorothy Road, close to the uh, Little John intersection facing the uh, area where the project is um, supposed to be built. Yeah. So I heard the conversation about the uh, water table and the sump pumps. So yeah, I just want to share my experience about my basement the floor of my basement is less than four feet below Dorothy Road and so there's something I experienced when it rains uh, it doesn't so it doesn't necessarily relate to the uh, uh, rain but even a few days later the uh, sump pumps keep working non-stop so I think this is uh, speaks to the uh, underground water table that we were uh, mentioning before so just sharing my experience, that's what happens. Uh, I live uphill from this project. And again, my basement is less than four feet. And uh, I do experience uh, the sump pumps working for days on a row. Not necessarily right after it rains, but you know, they keep going for several days. So I just want to make sure that my experience is shared as a perspective of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just ask the applicant to keep that in mind as well. Um, so at this point, uh, we have run through all the people with raised hands. So I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment period for this evening. Um, we'll thank everyone for, for all their input and uh, especially for, for being patient while we made our way through the list. Um, so at this stage, um, you know, we have a, a fair number of points that were raised. Um, and we certainly have a lot, of, a lot of questions that have been asked um, and we're looking for clarification on a fair number of points. Um, I think one of the sort of the, the most critical questions that was asked um, is really sort of, because we've had multiple iterations of the project, we've had multiple um, additions and deletions and modifications. Um, 
it is, there are some aspects of the project that's a little unclear as to exactly what is being proposed um, and what is being requested um, of the board. And so I think um, the it would be certainly very helpful to the board and to the, you know, to the town in general, if we could um, sort of have a, a revision to the plan that is a little bit more sort of definitive as to exactly what is being proposed and to link that with um, specifically with, with a, a proposed set of conditions so we can sort of better evaluate what exactly is before us at this stage. Um, and then that's something that we can ask to have, uh, yeah, we can ask Beta to take a look at. Um, the current proposal that came in, I have forwarded a copy or forwarded a request to review the documentations, uh, both to uh, the fire chief and to uh, the director of um, health and human services to review. And so I, I, I'm waiting, uh, they've only had a couple of days to look at it. So I'm waiting for a comment back from them, um, which I'm hoping can address some of these questions about emergency response um, and about uh, sort of scope of services and how that, how that would impact the town. Um, and then we had touched briefly earlier about um, sort of the, the disposition of the, the lowland areas. So the, the portion of the site where the building would be constructed is, is sort of the high ground um, at the northern end of the, of the, the, the large, the much larger site. And the, the disposition of that remaining portion, um, there is an ongoing effort between the town and the board and the the applicant to come up with um, an agreement that um, that can be put forward, and so that would be tied to conditions on the um, on the project itself. And then going back to conditions, um, you know, the obviously the draft decision that we had had started on earlier, uh, we sort of need to to scrub and start again in a lot of ways. Um, so there is a fair amount of work that needs to happen, both from, from the applicant side and, and from the board side um, and from the town as well. So the at the moment, the way the yeah, you know, we have until currently we're scheduled to close the hearing before on or before June 25th, um, which is feeling awfully soon at this point. Um, and so I would like to uh, briefly ask members of the board to where where they stand at the moment in terms of um, you know what how do, how do they feel about the level of information we have so far? What are their outstanding questions? And you know what sort of time frame do we need in order to be able to you know properly address these questions and concerns? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I think that we need to we need to slow down a bit. Um, I, I understand we've so far we've basically extended the hearings um, meeting by meeting with the extension of the closing date, which always being sometimes as little as a day after when we have the hearing. But at this point, I think that we are really close. We, the general, the general outline of what will be the proposal, is now before us. Um, today, there were a bunch of questions that came up. Beta has looked at, but has not really had an opportunity to give us advice as to what we, the issues we should be concerned about are with respect to both wetlands and flooding and that sort of thing and also with respect to traffic. So we have a very general idea, but we're now at the point where we need to make a decision. We need to think about coming to conditions and so forth. And we really can't, I mean, I can sit here and, and sort of repeat the things that came through my head during the course of today's hearing, 
but that really doesn't substitute for having our peer review engineers looking at all of this and telling us what the questions are and what possible answers are and getting clarification and so forth. So I don't think we're at square one. Actually, I think that we're very far along and we have a good framework that we have to work with. Um, but I think that we need to proceed in a methodical way, uh, starting with a restated application that enables us to say, well, this is what the proposal is. This is what's in it. This is what isn't in it. Uh, and this is what might be in it, depending upon uh, further discussions between the board uh, and the applicant. Um, I also think that it would be helpful going forward when we get to the point where we can actually are getting to conditions in sort of our, our second effort to, to put together a draft decision. Um, one of the problems that we had before was that we were doing this kind of in real time with a deadline looming over our heads. And the result of that was that the applicant never really got to see more. I mean, they, they were just seeing work in progress. Um, bits and pieces of things uh, and the conditions themselves uh, didn't really have the input of, of the applicant on them. Uh, and I would like to make sure that when we get into the point where we're actually having conditions, that we understand where there's a disagreement on the part of the applicant and we can get those things resolved before the hearing closes, because once the hearing closes and we're down to just writing the decision, we can only guess about what the applicant's reaction is. And we're not in a position of accommodating what might be completely uh, reasonable concerns. Now, obviously there may turn out that what we approve, if we approve anything, uh, is going to be either in the applicant's view uneconomic or they may appeal for some other reason. But surely we don't want to do it because we did something that we thought was okay that turned out not to be okay and that the everything is then comes unstuck uh, because we didn't have enough of a conversation. So I think that we need to carefully think about how much time we really need, how much time beta needs to get back to us, how much time the Conservation Commission needs to raise the issues that came up today and anything else that, that beta may come up with, and then to really have a consultation with the applicant to figure out uh, what kinds of things we should can fit into this uh, and what can't. And that also is a time period that may allow us to make some progress on figuring out what to do uh, with the lowland parcel and, and how that should be dealt with, both in terms of how it's disposed, which we've talked about, but also in terms of, uh, of some of the is other issues that, that relate to it, both the quality of what's, what's there uh, and uh, dealing with, with the other situations that uh, re require a lot of sensitivity. We're not gonna solve all those things, uh, and other agencies of the town government are going to have to be involved. And uh, so it's not entirely up to us, uh, but we need to make, we need to allow ourselves to make progress. Otherwise, I'm afraid that by running lap by lap, rather than running the whole race, uh, we're going, we're, just, we're really sort of not coming together as quickly as we otherwise could. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dupont. So I, um, I think that there's been a good deal of effort made at trying to respond to the concerns that have been expressed by the neighbors and by the town at large with respect to the type of building and I think that the engineering questions that have been raised, I feel like those have been fairly well addressed. My concern is more that I feel that I'm operating in the dark in terms of what the proposal actually is. And I'm a bit disconcerted at the lack of specificity. And I understand that when uh, we came to this where it was being introduced as independent living and assisted living together, um, and I believe it was Ms. Kiefer who rightfully so said, well, you know, what were your thoughts addressing the board? What were the thoughts and feelings that the board might have with regard to this type of a proposal? And I think that our response was generally speaking fairly positive. But as I sit here tonight and it's been moved 
from the assisted and independent living um, combination to the independent living with services, I paid very strict uh, attention to what Ms. Gibson had to say because of her experience dealing with elderly populations. And I realized that, you know, this is, as I think she indicated, you start out with a certain population in a certain condition, and then that can change pretty quickly over time. And, and I think that, you know, when the question was put to Ms. Noyes, she made a reference and said, he says, and I believe she was referring to an expert that they have employed. But what I am looking for is some much greater detail, much greater specificity, and a commitment to a specific plan which can tell us more about, well, how many people do you envision are going to be employed there providing meals? And how many deliveries do you expect to have per day? And how many people as they move sort of on that spectrum from being independent to more like uh, needing assisted help, how many people do you anticipate are going to be coming in to deal with those issues? Because I think what Ms. Gibson was describing is that you have a population which has in fact uh, moved from independent to assisted living, but not with the help of the, necessarily with the help of the uh, owners of the property because they're sort of doing it on their own. So I really have very little feel for what it is that's being proposed. And I think the suggestion is made by the applicant that we're the ones who should be supplying them with more direction as to what it is that we want to see them do. And I look at it conversely. I want to see them come to us and say, you know, here's what our expert says. This is what we can expect to happen to a population of people between 80 and 90. Here's where we think that, you know, they're going to cross over the boundary from independent to assisted living. And as a result, this is what we expect to see in terms of the numbers of people who are going to have to show up and attend to these people over time. I mean, that's the information I want to have because that impacts all of these suppositions that are being made about whether parking is adequate, how many people there are gonna be coming and going on a daily basis. And the point was also made about the numbers of trips of emergency vehicles that are gonna be coming into this area potentially at all hours of the day and night. So I would like to know in much more detail and with some greater level of commitment what that is supposed to look like based upon the representations of the expert who they believe you know, that has a great deal of information to share, which raises another point, which is how do we then take information like that? And how do we assess that information? Because at this point, we haven't had an opportunity to have someone who is uh, familiar with that type of um, you know, project and that type of a population, which begs the question about should we have our own expert looking at these sorts of findings that I'm requesting be shared with us uh, by the applicant. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I speak to that issue? Because I think I have something that could help be helpful. Please, Mr. Clifford. Um, the person we've referred to tonight is, is our consultant or, uh, or, or whatever. We, we, have, uh, we, know him. we know the organization very well, and we know the person very well. And um, I went back and looked at some of my notes, and we, he, he, he knows how many trucks arrive uh, for bread, for fish, for... Uh, he has a lot of information, and I, I'd like to bring him into this, because I think you're making a very good point. I really appreciate your point, uh, Mr. Devon. And uh, I, I think that, um, you know, the ball is in our court to speak to this because it, it is an issue. I mean, you, the people there are sort of predictable, but it's all the services that come, the trucks, the food, the medical services. Uh, and this, this, this group, it's, it's a company. It's a fairly large company and they, they manage or own 
a number of facilities that you all know of in the area. So uh, he has facts and figures about all these things. And so this, is, this does not need to be a mystery. And I think I certainly wouldn't, you know, take away your, your thought to hire your own person, but I think you need to see how credible uh, this person and this organization's information really is because they manage so many highly respected uh, facilities of this type in the area. And we have worked with them over a period of 20 years. Uh, we've owned uh, as developers a facility with them uh, for a number of years. And uh, so this, is, this could be, I think, really speaks to the issues you just brought up, which I think are, are quite legitimate. Well, thank you. I think that would be quite helpful. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Could I just, one th other thing that I, that just to add to Mr. DuPont's list is as I listened to Ms. Gibson and began thinking about what happens when people who start at roughly my age and get older and frailer, um, and the underlying structure here is basically that a basic level of services, one meal a day and, and your rent is covered essentially within the scope of, the, of, of your buying the apartment. But at least the business model that's been described uh, means that increasingly services that people may require necess as necessities uh, or at least of very, valu very valuable things um, soon get beyond doing the laundry and to lots of other things as well. Um, and I would like to understand better the sort of the social position of the people who occupy the affordable units once so much of the cost of maintaining themselves in this uh, or maintaining oneself in a facility of this kind is coming from what you pay over and above your rent, which by hypothesis, many of these people would be hard put to afford. Uh, and you get the emergence of a potential discrimination or not discrimination, but a, just a sense of difference uh, where the policy is supposed to be that people sort of blend right in, that, that they're not isolated as the affordable people. But the ones who don't have AIDS um, may turn out to be the the ones occupying the affordable apartments, and I don't have a pre. I don't really know enough about how this all works, um, but and I would love to have to have the opportunity to discuss this with with someone. But it is giving me some pause that that there's something about the underlying supposition of 40B projects that seems to be slightly askew in the proposal, and I would like to understand a lot more about that. Thank you, Jim. Are there further questions from the board at this point? Okay, so I guess the, there are sort of a couple different questions in front of the board um, at the moment. So one, it was very specifically, obviously we have to continue the hearing, um, but to Mr. Hanlon's earlier point, you know, we can, we can continue for two weeks, but then we are basically a day shy of the, the closing period. So um, I guess, and you know, are we, I, I guess a, a question for, for Ms. Kiefer to, to discuss with her, with her clients is, you know, what sort of a time frame do we, do we really, you know, what sort of time frame really makes sense in order to you know, be able to fully vet, vet these questions to be able to, um, to come to a much better sense of what, what exactly the request is of the board um, and go you know, enable the board to, to, to reach a decision that where the board is comfortable knowing um, both what the, what the applicant's opinion is of, the, of, of a potential decision um, and knowing that the you know the board having a set of confidence as to what the outcome will be with the uh, what once a decision has been rendered as to whether you know whether the you know that that what we're agreeing to is what what is actually before us on the table. Um, if we're if we are 
um, going to be agreeing with an application. Um, and so at this point, you know, I think we would be, I don't know if we can, you know, specifically request it this, you know, this evening. I don't know if you guys would even have a sense as to what sort of a time frame would be appropriate. And I'm not sure the board necessarily has a sense as to what sort of time frame would be appropriate. Um, but I think what I would propose um, this evening is if, you know, obviously we would request a continuance. Um, and then at that next hearing, I think we would, one of the first topics we want to discuss would be, you know, what is a realistic time frame to, to fully vet you know, all the outstanding questions on this on this new proposal um, so that we can come to you know come to a, a more final agreement um, without as you know as Mr. Hanlon said you know sort of constantly kicking the kicking the can slightly down the road. Mr. Chairman to be just as one additional thing if if we wanted to one possibility might and again this is depends upon it's up to Ms. Kiefer and and Gwen Nart and, and and the applicant. Um, but it has been raised to talk to the consultant uh, that that Art did. If that is doable in a per hearing that has basically two per 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 two purposes, one is to deal with those issues and just to have that out. And if that can be done in two weeks, and the second purpose is to agree on a timeline, mm -hmm. um, that might provide a way of moving things along and giving us giving ourselves the opportunity to proceed in a more deliberate fashion. Does that sound amenable to to Ms. Kiefer and to Art and Gwen? Well the one uh, Stephanie the uh, I, I think what you're proposing uh, is that we we somehow bring the information that our that our consultant would have and bring it in. Bring him, bring him in. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we need to talk to him. So I, I think yeah. what we have to do before we set a time frame, he's a very busy fellow because oh, he's uh, so let us talk to him. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know, 100% with you on this and uh, see what we can do to get him to come forward. And, uh, you know, I've grilled him on a lot of this stuff, you know, how many trips and who brings the fish and that kind of stuff. I know he knows all this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you want to know it. So, uh, you know, we didn't bring that tonight. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's see if we can get it here because I think it's important. Um, so, I mean, why don't you, I, I don't know how you handle that, but I, we can't guarantee anything until we talk to uh, you know, our, our you know, mysterious fellow that we haven't invited. Well, I think we can certainly. Um, Continue, you know, continue to a date certain, and then determine specifically what the the topic will be um, as we get closer to that date. Um, but obviously, knowing that you know this is what we would prefer to be able to discuss because this, I think, will get at a lot of the questions that are still out there in regards to parking and traffic and you know use of the site and the and those kinds of issues. Um, so the, the two dates that I had sort of in mind, um, so the board does have a hearing coming this upcoming Tuesday, um, but we could either look at either Tuesday, June 22nd or Thursday, June 24th. Um, you know, the, the board typically meets on Tuesdays, but we have for this hearing, we have slowly shifted to meeting on Thursdays. And I don't know if Tuesdays or Thursdays are better for um, for anyone, why don't we go ahead to the 22nd? See if we can get wow. Just pencil in the 22nd. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'm not available either the 22nd or the 24th. Ah, okay. I am available on the 29th if you want to do it. That's fine. I believe we have, so we have two other hearings on for the 29th as well. Um, Mr. Chairman, if if it turns out that the hearing, I mean it's it's eleven thirty, and yeah. but we've we've really dealt with practically everything tonight. If we have a 
delimited topic, which might actually just be timing if nothing mm -hmm. falls together. Uh, but if we had a hearing just on the issue of of how you, what and what a uh, independent living with services means and 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 that sort of thing, we might be able and we hold everything, including the comments uh, from the public, to that subject matter. Mm -hmm. We might be able to do that in in an hour, hour and a half, and still be able to handle the cases we already have for that night. Okay. Um. If that's the case, um, would it make sense, do you think, Mr. Hanlon, to, to start the hearing at 6.30 with this topic and then move on to our the other two hearings thereafter? Well, it, it might enable us to go to bed earlier. Certainly, and I, I'm, fairly, I'm fairly certain, um, and Rick, you can, Mr. Valorelli, I think you probably know this, that the hearing notices have gone out for the June 29th hearing, correct? They have, Mr. Chairman. Okay, for 7.30? 7.30. Okay. There would be no issue there if we were to put this in for 6.30 on the same evening. No, we can do that. Uh, I believe one of the cases on the 29th might take some time. Uh, the other one is um, not so time consuming. It should be straightforward. Okay. If it's June, we're talking June 29th. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see if we can get bus. So would folks be amenable with six thirty with six thirty PM on the twenty ninth of June? Uh yeah, so, we, we we can we can work with our schedule. We have we uh, if that's the, the, the best time uh what I, we, we can rearrange. I think it's really an issue of uh <laughs> of our the person that we'd like to bring in. So. absolutely. Yep. So I, I, we will do our best to, to do that and then try to do that in the next couple of days. Okay. We appreciate that. Okay, so then um, Mr. Chairman, I think one thing that the board needs to take into consideration is the potential that the ability to hold these remote hearings will no longer be in place. That's a very good point. The legislature is working on an extension, mm -hmm. the authority to, to, to conduct the remote hearings. Um, but I have not heard that anything has been passed just yet. And otherwise, I think uh, June 15th marks the end of the emergency order. Yeah, I think that we've, we've been advised that the 15th is the last date we can hold a remote hearing. Presuming it's not extended. Presuming there's no extension, correct. But I think at minimum you need to, when you do your continuance, continue to town hall. That may very well be true. Um, and so there's the possibility that it may also be remote. Right. And the, the advice from council has been to essentially sort of, you know, to indicate that, you know, if the that it will be held on Zoom unless that is no longer an option, in which case it will be held at Town Hall and to refer to the town website for additional information. Um, so if we were to continue to, the to June 29, that would be after the close of the hearing on the 25th. So we would need to push that out now. Um, how far should we push that? Mr. Chairman, I think that the sort of the purpose of what we're doing right now is to give us our time, give us a time. I mean, I would be willing to kick the can down the road on this one because the main point, it's sort of like a temporary injunction. You're trying to just basically give yourself time to actually work out what the real final date is after you've learn more about what the scope of the project is. So I'd, I mean, I'd love to hear what Ms. Kiefer has to, to say about wh wh where to do that, but I don't think that we necessarily have to, to know that tonight. I think that what we need is to know on the 29th, if that's where we're going, mm -hmm. what we think the schedule is that brings this to a conclusion. So, um... 
Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I think that, I mean, there's been a, um, a, a number of points that were raised this evening that we're very happy to um, give clarification or further address. Um, um, there was a, a comment, I think, I think Mr. Hanlon, you may have said something about um, um, the applicant to submit a reapplication. I just want to clarify that there were, um, it, 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 it was something you said along that line that I was like, no, it wouldn't be a reapplication. Um, but, and I don't think that that's what you meant. Um, no, I don't recall that I that I said that, but I think that that the chairman, in, the chairman in starting it sort of was looking for some sort of a restatement, I think is maybe the word that he meant so that we knew exactly what, so we knew what the application is as of now, given that there have been so many moving parts over time. I think that was the idea. Yes, and, and I think that's a very fair point. We're very happy to um, um, provide, you know, what what the proposal is, what it is not, in case there's um, concerns um, of, of prior um, project proposals and, and how they play with this. Um, and, and to do that and to provide updates um, with respect to the specific questions that were asked for this evening. And then the, the other component, obviously, is you, you want to have a little bit more detail um, as to what is senior living with services, what does that entail and, and, and things like that. And, and um, Art and Gwen are, are very much in favor of providing that for you. Um, and, and, and another piece of this is obviously um, the, the timing of when Beta has an opportunity to review the updated traffic and, and that, because I think that um, everybody here, the board, the applicant, the community, um, we, we've been at this hearing process for a very long time. And, and at some point we need to just say, let's, let's make certain we wrapped up all of the real loose ends. And, and you know, at, at some point you're not gonna have 100% precision on every single thing, but it's gonna be subject to a condition that, you know, that some, something is further provided within the final plan that are consistent with whatever. So, um, I'm giving you somewhat of a, of a long answer to your short question. I apologize for that. Um, but my suggestion would be that um, with somewhat similar with your, you know, short term kick the can. If we are back before the board on the 29 um, with the with the intention of um, kind of fleshing out better detail for the board, um, the, the limited scope being what is um, what are the various components of what does senior living with services mean? Um, but I think it would also be helpful if we could build into that um, a, a time when we're gonna get responses from data because I think that responding to comments that were received this evening together with the, the kind of peer review comments, um, we, if we could do that in one fell swoop, we would, it, it would help, you know, in addition to um, kind of restating what things are, but then to be able to do one kind of concise set of, we're responding to what we heard the, um, at this public hearing, and then we're responding to, or we're you know, taking into account what the peer review has said. So I'm not trying to put beta on the spot, but if they potentially have a time frame when they can get back to us, I think the information gathering can, can end maybe sooner than we think. Um, because I think that a lot of information has already come forward and a lot of it is just fine tuning or, or clarifying so everyone knows, because as you said, there's been a lot of information, there's been a lot of iterations to the project. So um, if we can kind of dovetail our, our efforts into, you know, something on in terms of the, the program of the senior living with residences and then responding to the additional questions and, um, having an ability to absorb peer review and, and respond to it or, or to address their concerns or say, we agree with that, we would agree with that as a condition, you know, or, uh, oh, they haven't understood this, let us provide this bit of information that perhaps was missing. So um, with, with that said, I think that maybe if we just continue the date, the hearing date, um, which was the first question. Um, so we have the, the 29th for the next hearing and then the conclusion of the hearing, if we just do that, so like the beginning of the second week in July. And I think that by June 29th, we're going to have a good sense of what additional information needs to come in and, and really where we are. Okay. So if we were to extend the hearing to 
say July 13th? I, I I'm would not, sorry, not continue the hearing. Sorry, extend the extend the period the review period. Right. I understand what you meant. Yes. I'm I'm okay with July 13th. Um, Art and Gwen, if you have a just one thought, uh, I'm trying to move this forward, is I think in the next uh, few days, I'll try to get you out the, uh, the name and organization that we're talking about here and a list of their projects, which are local. And I think, uh, you know, get that out to people, uh, to, to you all in time that, uh, you know, you could maybe check these out. I think they're all well established projects, projects with a great track record. The company has a great track record. And I think it would it would aid when you when you do listen to this person speak, uh, you know, will add to his credibility, which of course is what we'd like to have him be able to demonstrate uh, if you had that information. So Stephanie, I think we should try to get that lined up you know, as quickly as possible and get the names out and the places out um, so they can be circulated. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Could I raise, I mean, July 13th mm -hmm. is a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And um, I, th I thought I remembered that Mr. Haverty has advised us in the past that it's not a good idea to set the date for, to extend the date for closing the hearing to the very date that you may intend to, to meet on account of you never can tell what might happen. Um, and so I wonder if we're planning on thinking about wrapping everything up on the 13th, if that's something that is a serious possibility, we probably ought to pick, say, the following Friday, the 16th, as, as the closing day, just to give us some, some flexibility uh, and make sure that, that un, just un, make sure that unforeseen things don't suddenly put us in a very awkward position. Thank you. Uh, would that be a better one, Keeper? I'm amenable, it's July 16th. Okay. Okay then. So with with all that, um, so we would be <clears throat> um, extending the review period to uh, Friday, July sixteenth, and then we would be continuing the hearing um, to June twenty ninth at six thirty p.m. Right. Um, so then with that, um, I have a motion to extend the statutory 180 day period for conducting the public hearing to Friday, July 16th. So moved or seconded, whichever is more important. <laughs> it is moved. I have a second? Second. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Revelak? I know Mr. Revelak was having some technical issues earlier. He may not still be with us. Okay, Mr. Ford? Aye. Thank you, and the chair says aye. Uh, may I have a motion to continue uh, this public hearing until Tuesday, June 29th at 6.30 p.m.? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Aye. Second. Thank you. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Second. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on this hearing until June 29th. Um, so then just to um, next time of business, what I typically do um, is just review our upcoming meetings <laughs> and for everyone's edification, uh, just so we have them all straight. Uh, so the next hearing of the board is Tuesday, June 15th, which is at 7.30 p.m., which is a continued hearing for 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue. Um, then we will have a hearing on June 29th. Uh, at 6.30 p.m., which will be a uh, continued hearing for Thorndike Place. We'll also be a uh, first hearing for uh, projects at 10 Sunnyside and 55 Sutherland. Um, 
and then those are the hearings that we have currently scheduled. Then on Friday, July 2nd is the close of the public hearing on 1165 Bar Massachusetts Avenue. And Friday, July 16th will be the is now the scheduled close of hearing for Thorndike Place. Um, if everyone has those dates and those dates will um, be, should be up shortly on the Zoning Board of Appeals website and on our online calendar and agendas. So we are at the end of tonight's hearing. Um, thank you. Thanks to everyone for their participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, Kelly Linema, and now all the others who um, constantly assist us in preparing for and hosting our, our online meetings. Uh, please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding that recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at ACMI.tv within the coming days or weeks. Um, if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And so to conclude tonight's meeting, I would like to ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. Roll call vote, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you.